So, dear ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Antoja Polit Center, I would like to warmly welcome you to our joint seminar with the China Sea Institute. And uh, during my welcoming speech, I would like to focus more on the um, scientific cooperation between the EU and uh, China. So, um, it is natural that in our contemporary world, the parties consider each other as a potential partners and potential competitors at the same time. And as for the exact nature of cooperation, it is defined by politics, diplomacy, interest, and of course, the amount of funds available for joint research. With development of technology, the world is accelerating and we are struggling to keep up with it. And the digitalization, of course, can be a great solution to address many of challenges of the world. However, this is also a competition and it has become unavoidable that we entered in an age of Cold War in the fields of technology and science. The EU aims to be competitive and create a number of projects through which you can fund research. For example, Horizon 2020, which is also open partly to non-EU member states. Naturally, it is also in the EU's interest to launch a strategic cooperation with China, as a number of expert opinions prove that China is ahead in fields such as biotech, AI, space research and technology. China is already <laughs> spent 2.4% of GDP on R&D according to the latest figures. According to the EU joint roadmap, once it accepted, mixed research projects can be started with China. However, the 69 negotiation points are settled in the roadmap. Two broad areas can be utilized to jumpstart jump joint research in the meantime, food research and agriculture and climate change and biodiversity. And it is important to highlight that it, it is in the EU's and the US along with every other state's interest to deepen cooperation in order to find common answer to global challenges such as climate change, starvation and pandemics. We must know that, that the 2022 war between Russia and Ukraine created a new situation compared to 2019 when the EU declared China as a strategic rival and now EU-China cooperation is more important than ever before. However, we must also note that the EU is divided on the issue of the exact nature of cooperation with China, and there is no common ground even in the sea region. One only has to see the shift in the Lithuanian diplomat stance to see the emerging divide. The Russia-Ukraine war could also bring a new era in mending this divide. Because of COVID pandemic, China's result in enhancing um, rural flow and protection uh, of intellectual property required by the EU were not visible sufficiently from Europe. This process has to be strengthened, conduct a dialogue about it, and non, not send hostile messages over without solving the issue. We also understand that China has extended its zero COVID policy. We don't know how long and as such, we need to set economic and scientific cooperation accordingly. Sadly, this COVID restriction, for example, a weeks long quarantine paid by the foreigners makes scientific cooperation and conduct of joint projects much harder. Here, a degree of funding for the quarantine ways to utilize the required time in isolation usefully or longer time spent abroad also provides solutions to the problem. And of course, COVID pandemic had a negative impact on the Belt and Road Initiative and the investment attached to it. A number of similar initiatives were launched globally in the meantime in order to make the West the chief actor in the technological race. Such initiatives are the G7's partnership for global infrastructure and investments and the Global Gateway Initiative by the EU 
in last December. However, the issue remains how much funds will there be available to jumpstart infrastructural development. We must discover the synergies as only this cooperation can mend the damage after COVID. Also, the EU looks for alternative Eurasian transportation routes instead of Russia and creating them jointly in the Middle East with China is our common goal. Finally, the EU you also understand that looking at innovation, especially in robotics, the next century will be led by Asia. We are talking about a market of 5 billion and China is a 1.5 billion market. Cooperation in this area will be important as the EU and CE in particular has well-trained and trustworthy engineers. As for Hungary, Within our limited budgetary limits, we are aiming to make the most of the cooperation. In 2002, we signed the Hungary-China Scientific and Technological Cooperation Agreement. In this framework, the Hungarian National Research and Development Office offers standards every two years for science and technological cooperation promoting research mobility. The cooperation between the Hungarian and Chinese Academy of Sciences exists since 1984. This partnership has been extended in 2014 to establishing joint laboratories. Since that many Hungarian researchers conduct joint work with Chinese scientists. These were only some examples. A number of universities also launched cooperation with Chinese partners like the Budapest Medical University and Budapest Engineering University However, COVID has also limited the signing and realizing of this intended project. So we must against COVID because it is great that we have this joint seminar in online, but for scientific cooperation and the cooperation of scientists, the online space is simply not enough and it's not safe either. And I think the most and, and I think that the time loss during COVID should be made up by announcing many joint mobility programs so that we can gain a deeper insight into, into each other's research within the framework of trust. Because I think the trust is one of the most important key for the free cooperation. So that's what, that was what I wanted to say during my welcoming speech shot. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Veronica. Uh, and also thank you very much for your uh, very important uh, highlights regarding on this conference and as well as the potentials for the future China and the EU uh, cooperation. Uh, here, I also would like to welcome uh, all the participants and uh, panelists uh, for today's uh, conference. So good morning, dear colleagues in Europe, and uh, good morning, dear colleagues in China. Uh, good afternoon, dear colleagues in China. So we still have these online uh, events, but I hope, do hope in the near future, we will soon back to the ground and uh, have the face-to-face -face, uh, discussions. I think in the past three years, a lot of things have been changed. The first thing is the COVID, the pandemic. The, because of the pandemic, uh, it prevented uh, for the travels and it, it curbed uh, uh, the problem obstacles for the communications. So we are very lack of the communication face by face and only we have the uh, online events, uh, thanks for the modern technology, but it is not enough because the lack of the communication uh, could lead, um, lead to misunderstanding. So in nowadays, what you see is not necessarily what it is in reality. Let alone, so let alone, well, we cannot see each other face by face, only we can read or listen somewhere. But due to the technology, even what you read is not necessarily the reflect the real world. 
because the high technology can push information to you, push the information what you would like to read. And uh, <laughs> the other information, what you do not like to read, maybe cannot reach to you. So this is the important point. Uh, that's the reason I said so what you see is not necessary reflects the real world. And the second challenge is uh, uh, due to the uh, Russia-Ukraine conflict. So the, this conflict uh, not uh, promoted uh, emotional um, atmosphere in Europe, but it is also lead to some mistrust between China and Europe. So China is not Russia. So China not only not the Soviet Union, China is not the Russia either. So China is China. But because of lack of the communication and uh, some emotional atmosphere, uh, there is some changes also uh, between China, uh, between the relations between China and Europe. Some countries are in a hurry trying to work out a new China strategy. So we, uh, in recent days, as we have conference with the, uh, our European colleagues, we, I, I often to mention that uh, what are in a hurry? Why are you in a hurry? We cannot see each other for three years, not only the leaders, but also the, uh, the think tanks and also the, uh, the peoples. So we, maybe we, don't, we are not clear uh, how is the situation in Europe? And I think uh, for the Europeans, you are also not clear what are the situation in China. So in the lack of the communication for three years, why you are in a hurry to work out a new strategy on China? Even maybe you don't uh, uh, know what is actually happening and uh, what uh, China has been achieving in the past three years. So I, I uh, often mention them, um, let's wait for a moment if we are not so in a hurry, because I don't think China is a threat for Europe. It's not, uh, there is a war nearby the European border, the EU border. It is understandable that you have some emotional atmosphere. But for China, I don't think uh, China is a threat. And the actual threat at the moment, <clears throat> you are rushed to uh, work out a new strategy. So why not uh, we come down and uh, uh, wait for the moment we can see each other, meet each other, and we can have further detailed discussions. Maybe some of the misunderstandings uh, will be solved. So if we say the pandemic uh, occurred the problem of the communication and the conflict between Russia and uh, Ukraine uh, occurred the problem of the trust. So this is, uh, I think uh, in uh, Veronica, and the whole uh, uh, speech, she is also mentioned the, the problem of the trust. I think uh, rebuild the trust is the most uh, important task for the uh, uh, near future when uh, we go to the normal and uh, we can meet, each, meet with each other. Actually, uh, <clears throat> in, uh, in China, we used to say that European integration is a peace project. And in some extent, China's development is also a peace project. So Europeans, uh, based on the integration, you reached your uh, fortune and uh, you get yourself into a further development, advanced development. And for China, we based on our, our hard work, and uh, involving into the global uh, globalization and uh, work together with the global partners. We also had uh, reached some extent of the fortune and uh, some level of the development. So for, the mo for nowadays, the development is still the most important challenge for China. How we can follow the path of development to make a better life for the Chinese people, and uh, as well as for the who pro, try to provide the uh, public goods or the uh, 
uh, some scalable effects for the global uh, development. So this is uh, the most uh, challenging task for China. And for Europe, we understand that uh, you are now in an emotional environment and uh, some decisions have been done. It is not only uh, harmful for the economic development, but as well as for the people's living. So maybe it is the time for us to, especially after your summer vacation, so you have been relaxed from the uh, very uh, stressed work. Maybe it is a time uh, to think thoroughly and uh, think over what is really happening and uh, what would be good, uh, not only for yourself and not only for China, but uh, as well as for the future global trends. So it is very important. So this is the, I think this is the uh, point for today's conference. We try to uh, discover uh, the cooperation opportunities and uh, 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 analyzes uh, the current situation. And uh, we are looking forward uh, uh, for the near future if uh, uh, the pandemic is over and we're back to the uh, normal uh, traveling and meetings and we can contribute uh, for the uh, development of the bilateral relationship. So I would like to thank uh, all the uh, panelists for your active uh, presence and uh, in a very short time we can have this conference and I'm looking forward uh, for your excellent uh, speeches. And uh, also at the same time, I would like to thank uh, the UCF Knowledge Center, our uh, long-term uh, strategic uh, cooperation partnership. We have been worked together for more than five years. And even before the China Sea Institute had been established, we had already established our uh, very fruitful uh, relationship and as well as the confidence and the trust. And uh, I mean, it is uh, a lot for us. And I'm also looking forward to work with you in the future. And thank you for your support for co-organize uh, today's uh, conference. Thank you very much. So uh, we uh, close this opening uh, session and we move to the uh, first session of today's conference. And I see from the program, we found the uh, 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 familiar speakers. <laughs> we had worked together for a long time. And today it is my great honor to invite you to have your uh, excellent thoughts to present uh, for today's uh, conference. In the first session, we will have four speakers, uh, two from China and two from Europe. And uh, based on the agenda, I will uh, one by one to, to invite all the speakers. First, uh, I would like to invite uh, uh, Mr. Chen Yang, uh, Deputy Director of the Institute of European Studies at the China Institutes of Contemporary International Relations, the kicker. So Chen Yang, uh, the floor is yours, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you. Thank you, organizers. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to present my opinions, uh, my observation of the Synod and EU the relations. Right now, uh, I think uh, we cannot deny nowadays the Synod EU relationship is going through a tough time. There are so many challenges. Some of them we can not, we can predict. For example, the trade frictions a valued confession uh, value difference. But some of them appears suddenly without any notice, such as COVID-19. At the beginning of the pandemic, EU leaders show their sympathy and promise to support and help. And when the COVID-19 spread to Europe, China also provides medical and clinic goods to European countries. Everything seems well. Until one day, suddenly, the media and politicians in Europe started to criticize China 
for political propaganda and utilizing the industry trend dependence. Since then, the friendly atmosphere between China and EU had been destroyed. And since then, the sino EU relationship was in a motion of reforming. I'm concerned that the China-EU relations will suffer further damage. So it's urgent time to save this important relationship and may it can survive through the jungle or geopolitical competitions. In such circumstances, I have three suggestions for China and EU relations for the next years. First, we should rebuild the balance. The EU had, has made a triple definition on China, emphasize the need to maintain a balance among the three. This is fundamentally different from the fact that the United States simply regards China as a strategic railroad in all aspects. But if we follow the Europe's world and behaviors in recent years, we will have regions to worry that the balance among the cheaper definition will be disrupted and competition and revival will be stressed. In its recent public, public statements, the EU has repeatedly emphasized the solidarity, solidarity of the Western bloc, which was highly ideological and had a hint of co war. We also have seen a report from the think tank. Uh, the, the, the name of the report is the Reboot the Europe's China Strategy. It, declare, it claimed that we, uh, Europe should divide. Uh, to define China as a strategic uh, rival at first at the court. Uh, China will be regarded by the EU as an opponent in terms of values. Nowadays, the EU has again shown a tendency to decouple from China. Uh, we also see that the German finance minister Linda had uh, said Germany should do business with partners who share the same values. So uh, a little pandemic. At first step, I think we should emphasize the partner road. Do not let dispute seems louder than cooperation and cover the opportunity to develop the relations. Second, I think that we should rebuild the trust. Uh, as our chair said, the trust has some luck between the China and EU right now. There should actually be a lot of room for cooperation between China and EU. But due to the lack of mutual trust or too much politicized, politicization, pragmatic cooperation is easily affected. For example, China and EU should have strength cooperation to fight against the pandemic. But in actual fact, we have seen frictions between China and EU over anti epidemic policy policies, which sometimes even will upgrade to systemic disputes. The same is in Russia, the Ukraine, the conflict. China is not a direct party of the conflict. We seek to cooperation. We seek to cooperate with other countries to forge a path to ceasefire. But the EU has repeatedly criticized China for supporting Russia. The autonomy of each country should be respected. Therefore, in order to promote China-EU cooperation or other major power relations, we should firstly enhance mutual understanding. How to understand each other? Merck said at the farewell ceremony, ceremony, I would like to encourage you to always observe the world through the eyes of others or perceive the something uncomfortable and contra contradictory perspectives of other countries and work for the balance of interests. Even for the Russia-Ukraine conflict, we also need to look at the issue from a different standpoint. Of course, I'm not speaking in the name of Russia. When we discuss with our Polish counter uh, counterparts, they will also talk about their own security threats. Poland's security consent should also be respected. The thing is, cooperation can only be enhanced 
on the basis of mutual respect. Third, we should build the focus. The current Russia the Ukraine conflict has become the main focus of all parties, especially European countries, seems to have no other diplomacy. Since 2019, China EU relations have encountered many difficulties and now are greatly affected by Ukraine crisis. Although this is the most dangerous event Europe had faced since World War II, it's still not the hold of the international relations. The existing cooperation between China and the EU should continue to be perished and pushed forward. China supports the EU in terms of strategic autonomy, not because China tried to drive a wedge between the EU and US. In fact, most of the Chinese people understand that there is much more the common ground for the EU and the US to cooperate. Each country will choose its trusted partner to strengthen cooperation, just like the EU. We support multipolar world, nor bipolar or even unipolar. We hope the EU could be one polar in the world. So the space for cooperation between China and EU could be expanded. In fact, cooperation between China and EU is still very broad, including climate change, digital governance, etc., and even on security issues. We have seen that the EU has played a single role in mediating conflicts in recent years, such as facilitating the Minsk Agreement and hosting the Libyan International Conference. There is also some room for cooperation between China and EU in this regard. If the EU could be strategically independent, it would be easier to decide the cooperation with China based on its own need. The negative influence from the United Nations states will be reduced. So the potential of China-EU cooperation is still, still three. I think there are three principles that are of high importance. First, economy ties should never be cut. Second, dispute of values may exist, but we need to minimize its negative impact. Sensitive issues must be dealt with very carefully. We are both so smart, so I think we can deal with that. Three, global issues provide China and the EU with more potential to cooperation. They should be given special attention to. Right now, uh, just last month, the UK ambassador in China, uh, we have a meeting with her, uh, and she has, uh, we asked her about her uh, impression of China. What, what's the what's the most important uh, most uh, uh, in, impression of China of uh, of her, and she said directly directed it and very immediately answer the question about that use the name use the uh, use the word pragmatic. Uh, they, uh, she said the Chinese people is very pragmatic. I wow. think that it's uh, it's the it's the very important messages from that. Uh, wow. We all can. Uh, 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 I think that it, uh, it's very, uh, it's very uh, interesting. Uh, also, we can get a good message, and uh, right now, the relationship between the Western Bloc and the Russia, I think, that cannot be uh, ease, cannot ease uh, in a short time, and the China, the U.S. Uh, uh, the, the relations also the, cannot be fundamentally changed uh, into a honeymoon in a short time, in a nearby future. And so in between the uh, big powers, um, among the big powers, uh, I think the China, the EU, and, uh, our cooperation uh, are so important right now in the world. We should uh, promote, uh, our cooperation can promote uh, the community the circu circulation and ensure the economic pro prosperity Paris and safeguard the your Asia the continued security that's so important uh, I think my uh, that's all my opinions thank you thank you 
Thank you very much, uh, Chen Yang, uh, for your uh, very uh, constructive uh, proposals and uh, suggestions. And we can <coughs> discuss these uh, suggestions later in our dis uh, uh, discussion session. Uh, thanks again. Dragana Mitrovic, uh, she is the head of the Center of University of Serbia. Uh, Professor, the floor is yours, please. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. It is my pleasure to be with you today and to exchange opinions and uh, results of our research on uh, EU-China relations, uh, current uh, ongoings and um, the perspective of, of that uh, crucially important relations, not just for the two sides, but also globally. Um, it's a really pity that we cannot meet in person yet but we, we all hope that it will be possible quite soon. But before that, it is also very fine that we can uh, continue our cooperation thanks to these technological um, possibilities to, to meet. Uh, I, I, I suppose I have a 15 minutes. Is, is that so, Veronica? Uh, I would like very much to thank Veronica and our colleagues from um, the Institute for organizing this event and for inviting me to deliver my speech today. Um, well, I'll, uh, I'll start for sure. Uh, well, I just said that um, EU-China relations or China-EU relation uh, is uh, one of the most important global relationship uh, because the two entities are um, the greatest global traders, if, if nothing else. And as we know, trade and investments are major drivers for, for global economic growth. Uh, that we all uh, rely upon when it comes to uh, employment, income, and uh, our quality of life, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, as we know, inequality and um, within countries and global inequality is one of the major of the major issues that uh, um, the world faces today and causes of so many problems from uh, uh, social oppress, uh, misery, uh, terrorism, etc. And cooperation in this field between China and European Union is also and has always been very important uh, uh, beyond what my colleague Chen just uh, um, mentioned as key areas. I would add uh, green energy and I would add anti um, climate changes as one of the main and so important areas for cooperation that should never be uh, stopped and uh, that both sides and for sure Chinese side is paying a lot a lot of attention to it but um, I could of course we need to remain optimistic and rely on that dynamics of the relations no matter what COVID interruptions of uh, global production and and the trade chains uh, caused and also Ukrainian war that cast shadow over everything because European Union, unlike before, became extremely ideological and uh, extremely dependent of uh, USA and uh, NATO causes in, in uh, globally looking at these causes. And also, uh, so we have to be also realistic about the current situation because the deep misunderstanding and the expressions of these uh, misunderstandings between European Union and China started uh, of course, before. And as we know, uh, Brussels was particularly upset with the establishment of 16 plus one framework of cooperation. And there was a strong and has been strong criticism since the beginning and it only enlarged uh, over time. And then, and there was a pressure on uh, participating countries and uh, there, were t uh, there was also um, narrative on how China is dividing uh, European Union and uh, with the strategic aim to lessen its unity, etc., etc. And also we've seen uh, two 
key document uh, introduced by European Union in uh, 2018, like connectivity strategy between Europe and Asia, adopted in September 2018, and the EU-China strategic outlook in 2019, named uh, at that document China as a systemic rival as well as a partner. And uh, also we've seen in recent uh, developments, uh, uh, just also heard from Professor Chen what happened during the COVID outbreak and that uh, strong narrative um, accusing China of uh, uh, spreading the poison and then selling the cure, etc., etc. So that was also very bad, of course, uh, and, and uh, terribly bad influenced the relationship. And I th and also we know that the European Union introduced sanctions upon uh, China and its officials based on the accusation of breaching human rights in Xinjiang and in uh, crashing democracy in Hong Kong. And when one side is introducing, of course, China uh, reacted in, um, by introducing sanction on certain institutions and individuals in European Union, uh, because when uh, one party introduces sanctions upon others, it's uh, so it's a self immense act of uh, alleged superiority because allegedly superior side is punishing a uh, less powerful side. But European Union, uh, decades before these events, uh, just omitted to notice that China became global power with not just uh, uh, enormous economic strength, but also political and cultural strength built upon this uh, global economic grasp. But and European Union uh, being self-absorbed on one side uh, based on its self-declared uh, ideological and values-based superiority uh, uh, finds uh, itself uh, alleged to preach everybody about uh, how other countries, including uh, great powers as um, China and Russia, should behave because if they do not accept such recommendations and particular behaviors, they should be condemned and then uh, sanctioned. And recently, the Ukrainian war just uh, uh, drove that, that, um, uh, that uh, tendency uh, to the uncompared level and to uncompared strength because European Union was uh, totally uh, lost in its perception of its own interests, uh, where its own interests uh, lies and uh, lie, sorry, and uh, what are the particular interests of the United States of America and of NATO. So European Union is now suffering enormous economic uh, impacts of its uh, totally wrong and self-destructive decisions on imposing particular sanctions on Russia. And uh, it's actually fulfilling decades long US aims to separate European Union from Russia as an energy supplier, as a partner, and um, uh, totally relying politically and uh, militarily upon United States of America. And as we know, China was declared by uh, all set of uh, documents um, adopted by USA and finally by NATO as a challenger. And uh, by definition, the dominant global power um, wants to prevent other potential challengers uh, to obstruct its uh, dominant position and maybe to become uh, competitors and to overthrow it at one point. So um, we've seen uh, uh, the, the strong shadow actually 
almost a direct interference uh, interference in EU-China EU relations by the United States of America and even NATO, because we've seen a new extended NATO function in Indo-Pacific as part of American Indo-Pacific strategy. And we've seen certain European powers, uh, UK, which is no, no longer EU member states, but we've seen German and France taking part in the activities within the United States of America in the Pacific strategy. Um, that is for sure not helping EU-China relations to uh, develop and uh, at the somehow uh, jeopardize the trust to be uh, reconstructed and re-established because trust is a basic uh, uh, element of any substantial uh, strategic partnership and the quality of relations between China and EU for sure is a strategic partnership but now with uh, terrible damage done by uh, several events and tendencies. Um, so uh, I, I could um, add to my speech that this uh, strategic pressure uh, put uh, simultaneously on Russia and China for sure had pushed China and Russia more strongly uh, together when opposing that strategic pressure. But also, uh, it is super, it would be not true to say that it happened because of the Ukrainian conflict, uh, basically proxy war that EU unfortunately got deeply involved into. And uh, because um, there were developments uh, decades before and um, the strategic uh, neighborly comprehensive cooperation between China and Russian Federation, Shanghai Cooperation Organization with its framework and all layers of cooperation between the two, uh, then uh, uh, BRICS uh, framework of cooperation and uh, other formats within um, uh, organization of United Nations and its uh, um, um, and its um, special institutions, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, between the two neighbors. Uh, so um, it would be and it is totally wrong to accuse China of being a, a partner and good neighbor to Russia because it's uh, basically rational behavior. And uh, as a citizen of uh, Serbia and a former citizen of former Federal Republic of Yugoslavia that was bombed by NATO countries, uh, which are dominantly, of course, led by USA, but most of the participants were from European Union. So at that moment, they illegally bombed my country. So it is very difficult now uh, to look at all their hypocrisy when calling upon international law and uh, talking about breaching international law and breaching one European country's sovereignty. So uh, they are, um, uh, what were they thinking when they attacked my country with no UN authorization, even without their own parliament's authorization? So hypocrisy of European Union is one of the elements that should be taken into account when uh, discussing EU-China relations as um, and China uh, uh, being for centuries um, victim of a predatory imperialistic behavior of certain European powers has a long history of facing that hypocrisy. So all that uh, should be taken into account when we talk today about EU-China relations that I would say, like to say again, are of extreme importance, not only for China and not only for European Union, and not only because they trade on a daily basis between 1.8 billion up to 2 billion euros on a daily basis, and not only because the, they're so connected through investments and all possible layers of cooperation, and that cooperation should be deepened, respected, and developed. But 
uh, European Union should, it is my understanding, have more respect for other cultures and civilizations and other countries' uh, genuine right to choose their path of development, to choose and be um, uh, adherent to their own values and to engage in cooperation, not from the positions of alleged and self-assumed and self-declared superiority, but uh, on the level of equality of, of partners in one uh, in, in, in the cooperation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Tolakna Mitrovic. Uh, your speech is uh, very uh, uh, inspiring. Uh, for example, it recalls me uh, two things. Uh, one is that uh, uh, we are living in a world with uh, complexity. So the world is interconnected with different kind of domains, different kind of relations. So. For nowadays, it is very difficult to say white or black. So how to judge a thing simply white or black? It's impossible. So if we go into this very uh, narrative way, maybe it is not the output you would like to uh, find out. So this is first. Uh, uh, thoughts from your uh, speech. The second is about uh, NATO. Uh, uh, several uh, uh, days ago, we had another conference uh, with the European colleagues, and uh, I asked them. So I mentioned that after the Cold World War, there was no war in Eastern Asia. There was no war in Pacific region or even in the Indo-Pacific region, like the United States would like to say, after the Cold War. There was no war in this region. But after the Cold World War, uh, after the Cold War, there are several wars initiated by the United States in the name of NATO, like the war you mentioned in uh, Belgrade, in, in Yugoslavia, former Yugoslavia, the war in Iraq, the war in Syria, and the others I would, not, I would not like to mention. Then the question is, who is the war lover? <laughs> and now in the latest NATO summit, they treat China as a challenge, somehow as a threat. So it is very interesting. There is no war in the China uh, nearby neighbors for the 40 years and uh, a block had initiated several wars in the latest 40 years, and they treat China as a threat. So the logic is very, very interesting. I, I don't understand how they can get this output. And uh, I also don't understand why the members, because a lot of members of the NATO are also the members of the European Union. And as I mentioned, EU European integration is a peace project. That means the member states of the European Union, they are peace lovers. And now they are follow the other track and treat China in a block of the war and treat China as a <laughs> challenge. So this is very, uh, very also uh, interesting. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Dorota Mitrovich. You, you provide also some uh, in thoughts for your inspiring speech. Thank you again. To uh, next speaker again. Okay, Professor Zhao, invite our next uh, speaker, Kushai Shandor, and he is now uh, associate professor at uh, Pasmani Peter University. And uh, uh, Professor uh, Shandor, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Uh, yes, very and, clearly. Uh, Good morning and good afternoon to everybody in Europe and in China as well. Uh, I uh, would like to talk, to continue the ideas in a positive sense, but uh, my reasons for being positive are very limited. 
Uh, I want to talk about uh, the challenges facing uh, the strengthening of the EU-China cooperation at present and for the foreseeable few years. And the challenges are big. Uh, we are living in an era of transition and transformation globally. And in China and in the European Union as well. And during these transformation processes, it is very difficult to make uh, predictions or even recommendations for immediate or medium term actions or policies. But what we can do, we can analyze the situation what we have at present. So I will share with you my short analysis of the situation, uh, which is not a scientific truth. These are only my thoughts, my analysis, which may be not right, may be mistaken, but please take it into consideration. I want to help you to think about these things as much as possible. Uh, first, I will talk about three points. I will talk about the geoeconomic transformation of the world. Then I will talk about the geopolitical transformation of the world. And then I will talk about uh, the transformation of the EU-China relations. So I begin with the geoeconomic transformation. The International Monetary Fund's recent papers talk about the formation of large economic and financial clusters in the world. They talk about, although they try to avoid the terminology of deglobalization, but in substance, they write about it. What we see is a process of reg regionalization of the world economy, which means uh, that the globalization is changing. I don't like personally the deglobalization de terminology because I think the world will not fall apart economically fully. But uh, the tendencies and characteristics of the globalization will be changed. And th this change is going on now. What we see is the change just I mentioned to you few major elements. One of the basics in the real economy is the changing of the supply chain and production change, the value chains in the world. How much goes it back to the last economic crisis? How much is connected with the COVID-19 pandemic? It's less important now. We can analyze it later. It's not so important as the fact that it is happening. Uh, we have a limited or a decreasing capital flows all over the world. And we have plenty of financial restrictions in the globalized financial world. Just think about sanctions against sanctions against Russia or, or um, new uh, rules for Chinese investment, Chinese companies on the New York Stock Exchange and so on. You, you will see a lot. We have uh, a formation of regional economic financial clusters. We see it uh, in the Western world, US, EU structure, the dollar, euro structure, and in other parts of the world, uh, change of world markets den denominated in dollars, decrease of dollars, trade between China and Russia in uh, rubles and, and yuans, and so on. So what we have is a process of formulating new structures, new systems in the global economy, which 
goes together with the creation, a needed creation of new roles of, for interactions in the global economy. Just to add, uh, just to mention to you one example, the trade rules practically don't work. The old trade rules. The WTO is paralyzed, in fact. So we need new rules, but the new rules are not present yet, and it is not clear who and how we'll formulate them. This great restructuring go, uh, process goes with a, within a form of deep crisis. We are at the beginning of a deep, deep economic crisis, but we are entering it deeper and deeper all over the world, including Europe, including the United States. We have uh, many crisis signs in the developing world and so on. This crisis is not only economic in the real economy, stoppage of more a few hundred factories already in Europe, which will bring up unemployment and other problems, but also in the financial, in the uh, social structures as well. And the challenges are growing. We have a narrowing of consumer markets. We have volatility of capital and currency markets. We have new industrial structure uh, emerging or forming uh, in via some sectoral de deindustrialization of some countries. We are losing industries in Europe and not only in Europe. And we are moving into a new phase of digitalization with formulation of separate uh, forms, separate uh, financial structures. Uh, that's what we have now. Uh, we have a geopolitical transformation. Just a second, if I may, I would stop for a minute. I have some problems here. Within a minute, I will return. So this is the <coughs> weakness Hello? of the <laughs> modern technology. Hello? Yes. Hello? Yes? Uh, Professor Zhao? Hi. I can, I can, I can uh, listen to your voice. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, wait Sorry, ladies moment. and gentlemen. Everybody, Sorry, no. a, okay. Sorry, I had a difficult problem here, technical in in my apartment. Uh, I solved it. So, uh, if I may, I will uh, continue. Is it okay, Mr. Okay, please. Ben? Okay. Yes. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, so, yes, okay. Uh, Professor Tao is also back. I think uh, after speech, uh, Professor Tao will will. Uh, 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 catch up, okay? okay. Please, Ambassador, continue. Okay. So, uh, if I may continue, I will continue with the geopolitical transformation, which is the second biggest part of our present situation. Practically, this geopolitical transformation is getting the form of World War, according to my assessment. We shall analyze it as much as we can and take into consideration the situation and the only historic analogy what we have is the first Cold War. Uh, please Remember that the first Cold War lasted many decades and it had different phases. So we are now in the first phase of the second Cold War. It is the phase of formation of the camps fighting this Cold War. The camps are not formed 
finally and totally. We are now in the process of this formation. And as during the first Cold War, the first phase of formation of the competing uh, uh, camps was finalized or uh, symbolized by the Korean War, we see a similar situation today. And this situation is the Ukrainian war. How it goes, it's very difficult to say. I cannot say it. But I can say from my analysis that the outcome of this Korean Ukrainian conflict will finalize the formulation of the two competing sides of this new Cold War. There are three possible scenarios for forming. The first scenario is Russia's total defeat in this war, which will lead to an unprecedented total US global hegemony. What we haven't seen anytime, anywhere. The second, and I don't know whether it's realistic, we shall see, but in that case, the total US uh, uh, victory will mean the end of the Cold War. There will be no more phases of the Cold War. It will be simply end the whole thing. The second possible outcome is a big Russian military win in this war. I don't know how to define what it means, but if Russia wins, then we'll have a much faster crash of the present world order. And we, that, we, that would open up a long, many-phased Cold War, which uh, we shall see how long can last. And the third possibility is a kind of compromise solution. I send you back to the energy, analogy with the Korean War, which ended up in a no-win situation for either side. And still, we don't have a peace treaty, but we have, or a unified Korea, or, or whatever. We have a temporary solution for long, long decades. If this, if this Ukraine war end with, ends with some type of compromise, we will have an even longer Cold War. The two camps will compete in different fields, in different regions, and so on. But we shall understand that the Ukrainian war goes on not on the main theater of the Cold War. The main theater of the Cold War is the Indo-Pacific. It's also similar to the first Cold War. The Korean War happened not on the main front. The main front was in Europe. The second very first front was at that time in Asia. So we see the same. The competing parties fight their fight on the second very very important theater of war. So uh, the Indo-Pacific, where we see the escalation of tensions at present, uh, just see uh, Speaker Pelosi's visit to Taiwan, which will continue. If you see, if you look at in Europe Parliament decisions in different countries, a lot of European Parliament delegations will go to Taiwan very soon. And if you see some European countries diplomatic policies in the Baltics, in other parts, uh, they're leaving the 16 plus one cooperation with China and so on and so on. You see that uh, the visit of uh, Speaker Pelosi was not a single issue. It's part of a process. So we shall see how this Cold War situation, this first phase of the Cold War 
And after, as a result of the, the outcome of uh, the war in Ukraine, we shall see. It's very difficult to predict. And the third element, what I want to talk about, is the transformation of the EU China relations. The EU China relations will never be the same as they were before the COVID 19, let's say that. Uh, the geoeconomic transformation and the geopolitical transformation will have a major deep impact on EU-China relations. That is my conviction. We see great challenges in that field on both sides of the equation. Uh, and we shall take account of these challenges and we shall see how they will, will be solved within a few years. It's not issue of weeks, months, or summits of EU and China or anything. They cannot be solved in any meeting. They, they are processes and long-term processes or medium-term processes. What we see in Europe for challenges of the European Union is the repositioning of Europe in the new regionalized world order economically in the new type of uh, uh, global economics in, and how Europe can manage the upcoming and already developing deep economic crisis, social crisis, and other developments which are happening in Europe. Uh, the second element for Europe, the second challenge is how to regain some of its strategic autonomy. At present, Europe practically lost all the geopolitical autonomy of it. Europe practically follows American foreign policy, not only in the Ukrainian war, but on the Taiwan issue and many other issues, political. So it is very difficult for the European Union to formulate a united position and to work out uh, its own autonomous foreign policy. And it goes back or connected to the problem of internal problems of the European Union. The biggest challenge for Europe, it's not economic, it's not geopolitical, it's internal how the European Union can manage its own transformation. It must be transformed, reformed. There are different concepts how to go further with it, to eliminate veto power of single nation states or to create a, uh, some nation or some European Union of sovereign states, or there are many concepts, discussions until they are not settled, until we don't have a new European Union structure economically, socially, ideologically, or value, if you want that word, and politically, then uh, it is very difficult for Europe to handle the problems or issues or questions related to China. We have on the other side, some challenges for China. We know if we look up the statistics and the processes, we see that China has its own problems to solve. And those problems are not little. Those are economic and social in their characters. China has a new strategy of economic policy characterized by double circulation. It's very nice but I see very little of its implementation. Uh, in our conference, Mr. Chen Yang just <clears throat> talked about the importance of cooperating with Europe, the trade and so on. It's not the double circulation. It's the foreign economic ties based development still. So China shall do something with its own problems. Inter China shall increase internal demand 
consumption of the population, which means that Chinese people shall have more money, higher wages to consume the Chinese goods. If all the Chinese goods are consumed in Europe and the US and other parts of the world, Chinese economic development is limited. And uh, China must, will need a much more active, self-reliant, foreign economic and geopolitical policy. We don't know what is China's real position on major issues in the world. We know that China is not part of the Ukrainian conflict. Very nice. But what is China's policy? We know that China is abstaining all the time in the United Nations. By the way, uh, an institution which is losing its importance at, on our, at our sites. What is China's position? And the same goes with uh, changing of trade and other rules in the world, which are changing very fast. And finally, I think it's very important for both sides to solve their own problems. If the IMF is right, we see, if we really see a formation of big economic and financial clusters in the world, one cluster could be Europe, theoretically, if it solves its problems, which I mentioned. The other cluster center could be China, if China takes real steps for it. And then we will see within a few years, five, 10, I cannot tell you, after the crisis finished, which we are going into, for the new type of globaliza globalization, which will be characterized by interaction be between these big financial economic clusters. And China and Europe can build new cooperation strengthened cooperation if they form their own economic clusters and if they take a leading role in establishing new type of interactions between economic clusters in the world. There will be a few of them, but China and Europe has a chance to be one of the initiators of the intercluster globalization. And it will impact the political, the geopolitical, and all the sides. Uh, thank you very much for listening to my uh, opinion. And thank you very much for being so patient with my technical problems. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Bushai. Uh, uh, your uh, very deep uh, analysis uh, on the three uh, transformations geopolitically economically and as well as regarding to the china eu relations uh, thank you uh, again uh, just only two uh, comments from my side i would like to mention at the moment uh, the first is uh, about the uh, uh, european automatic uh, uh, strategic autonomy uh, i fully agree with you that uh, europe at the moment lost its idea on the strategic uh, autonomy. As I mentioned in my introduction remarks, everything is in an emotional way, and uh, they lost uh, what the, really they would like to think about. So for example, <clears throat> this example is actually connected to the geo-economically and the geopolitically, the energy. So if there is a shortage for the industries in Europe, especially for those strategic industries like our, our aluminum, like uh, the special uh, um, uh, wash and uh, special steel and uh, etc. So this having the situation uh, requires huge energy uh, uh, consumption. And in this winter, if the factories in these sectors closed, were closed, then the real issue is that it is very difficult to restart these factories again. And 
And how is about the supply chain? How is about the uh, value chain? How you can get your strategy autonomy if you cannot produce <laughs> yourself the strategic products? So this is a very quite interesting thing. So European leaders are very in an emotional way and ask the people to get less shower. It is not the point. <laughs> people can get less shower, uh, but it is not from a mouth of a politician. <laughs> the politicians, what the politicians should think about is about the strategic things or not about the daily lives of the people. So this is my first comment. And the second comment is about China, the dual circulation. <clears throat> the dual circulation, uh, there are a lot of analysis from different uh, disciplines, like uh, political scientists uh, thinks uh, in a one way and uh, economics uh, thinks another way. But, uh, and also China Sea Institute had a, a, a conference uh, especially on this topic, the dual circulation, uh, one month ago, I think. So if the participants are interested in, you can visit the webpage of China Institute, China Sea Institute, or you can down, uh, watch the YouTube. Uh, <clears throat> the point is that uh, in my understanding, the dual circulation is really about the uh, demand side in the economy. So here, the uh, Ambassador Kusha is uh, right that uh, China's economy in the nowadays, if the global demand is in weak, then the China's export will face a huge challenge. And in that case, how to stimulate the domestic consumption, the demand, this is the issue. So that's why we call due circulation, it's uh, connected with the people's life, because we said in the next uh, 10 years or 15 years or uh, 20 years, the, 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 the goal of the Chinese government is try to improve the people's life and uh, uh, to uh, be uh, in a better, fortunate way. So that means it will stimulate the demand side of the economy. <clears throat> but how to do that is, is, an, is another question. So a lot of policy instruments are required. But the main point is that uh, uh, if the global demand so is strong, then it's good. But if it were weak, then we need to find our uh, domestic uh, demand. So this is the situation. Uh, I would like to raise a, a, a question. <clears throat> uh, in this week, I think European leaders are back from their holidays and they have their big speeches like uh, the German Chancellor in Prague and as well as Macron in France. They all talk about the strategic autonomy. My question is whether this time they are really thinking about in this way or they try to fix some problems with their previous act activities. I don't know, Ambassador, do you have some thoughts? I can tell you my uh, impression that um, nothing new I heard in comparison with the last few months. And uh, I don't hear any serious concept for changes in, in the global environment, in the more, most acute problems. I see the same, I hear the same music replayed again and again and again. I think we haven't reached the phase yet, the, stadium, the, the status yet, when uh, certain political propaganda speeches are really confronted with social and economic realities. We will see that in the future, most probably. But at present, 
uh, it's not only the Ukrainian war. I, I would put it in the brackets because it's very clear that it is political propaganda, whatever goes on. And the consequences in Europe are, are uh, coming and deepening, but they are not threatening yet the everyday life of many people. It will take some weeks, months, until people really feel the consequences. At present, it's only future, seeing the future, some dangers and so on. But uh, the most, the even more disturbing for me is I don't hear any concept about what to do with the world, what to do with the global economy what to do with the global financial processes. I hear the same, not only in Europe, in the United States, in, in, uh, even in Russia. What I hear about the economic policy of Russia is going on the same way as they did before the war, which is clearly not realistic. Uh, the same goes in Europe and so on. So I don't see on the political level the understanding of the fundamental changes. I don't talk even about the United States. They are rising the basic um, lending uh, percentages. At the same time, they are accepting new laws which spend a lot of hundreds of billions of dollar, dollars they send into the economy. What they do with one hand, then they take away with the other hand. It's, it's simply, it means for me at present, everywhere, that there is no real conceptual outcome, no conceptual strategic plan, at least not in the phase of implementing anything. Uh, and it makes the situation even more volatile even more difficult, no political solution, no solutions in economic policies, no at least new concepts, what to do with the global economy, global finances. So the individual countries are in very, are in very difficult position, very difficult position. Everybody tries to make political decisions on the day-to-day -day basis. And they are contradictory, they are difficult, and so on. So at present, that's why I said in my contribution that I don't have the final answers because I am convinced that the time has not ripened for that. We need more time to see the processes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. Uh, Professor Mitrovic, uh, if you have some something would like to say you are welcome mm, thank you i wouldn't add very much i think uh, i could only repeat myself and what ambassador kushai said about the danger and you mentioned two european leaders uh, but we do not see leadership in their uh, posting in their words we don't see wisdom we don't see strategy and without strategy and strategic thinking and some visions, realistic, uh, because um, substantial European Union should have that power to be one of the um, uh, of the poles in multipolar world. It shouldn't be just a trade powerhouse or production powerhouse or something like that, investment, etc. It should have its own political uh, autonomy, but it doesn't have it, and we now have a set of extremely weak leaders uh, that are incapable of um, introducing decisions that are essential for preservation of the quality of life uh, economy in their countries because uh, during the covid pandemic they induced their central banks induced some 4 billion euros in their economies that of course created inflationary pressure then there was uh, uh, that was um, uh, extended even with the uh, uh, energy security crisis that occurred last uh, 
early last autumn because they wanted to shift to a green uh, energy. It is a wonderful idea, but it's totally, again, unrealistic. And they behave in a way like children uh, without really strategic thinking and relying on, um, on reality. But also, it's not just the lack of quality on their side. It's also obviously a lot of uh, corruption and a lot of influence from multinational organizations that found their way uh, to the top uh, uh, level, political level, when decision making uh, set is occurring. So all these decisions are disasters, <coughs> and now the lack of leadership is only making this situation more worrisome and more dangerous. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, please, uh, uh, Ambassador Shandor. I just want to, to say one phrase. And according to my assessment, at present we are in the stage when all politicians, all leading leaders of Europe, Russia, the United States, and even China, have a position that we will do the same like in the past, but better. And the situation is changing fundamentally in the global economics, in the global politics, and so on. So we, knew we need new approaches. Instead of that, what we get is we will do the same, but this time <clears throat> we will do it better and deeper. <clears throat> My God, I don't see any good perspective from that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chen Yang, uh, do you have anything for the comments? <laughs> no, no, I'm not your European. I have no right to comment. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank all the panelists uh, for your uh, wonderful presentations and uh, excellent uh, uh, comments uh, uh, in this session. So uh, still, I'm late for five minutes. <laughs> yeah, I would like to turn hand over the uh, moderator's role to uh, Veronica uh, and the whole lot. Uh, you can uh, uh, start your next session, please. Welcome back to the um, second panel discussion. So I would like to start with, with Mr. Zhao Junji. Uh, senior Research Fellow at the Institute of European Studies at the CAS. So, Mr. Zaudunji, the floor is yours. My, speak, my speech is about uh, EO's uh, re reception in China. So, during the limited uh, time, I just uh, give some ideas. How the EU perceive China and its practice? I think China-EU relations are one of the most important bilateral relations in the world. At present, there are some problems in China-EU relations, which have a lot to do with the deviation of the EU's understanding of China. My speech today is to talk about how the EU's perception of China has changed, what impact will this change have on the future direction of China-EU relations? I think since 2003, China and the EU have established a comprehensive strategic partnership. Bilateral relations have developed rapidly, and China-EU cooperation has yielded fruitful results. However, with the rise of China and the relative decline of Europe. The official perception of EU, EU towards China has changed. And the most negative views have begun to appear. In the eyes of the EU, China first changed from a long mainstream country to the EU partner, and then from a strategic partner to a challenger that is now rising rapidly. Correspondingly, the EU's China policy 
that's also changing from constructive engagement to comprehensive engagement. And then from a global strategic partner to today's institutional computation perception. In 2019, the EU issued the political document, EU China Strategic Outlook, making a significant change in the EU's China policy. The EU's new policy on China emphasizes the competitiveness of China and the EU in terms of economic, economy, system, and so on. China is not only a partner of the EU, but also an economic and technological computator and an institutional rival. It has established a review system from, for foreign investment. Generally speaking, the EU's current perception of China's rise is increasingly negative, and China is regarded economically as a computator that might pose a potential seat to it. Politically, they are disappointed that China has failed to turn to European values on security, the common topics between the EU and the United States began to increase and the cooperation was strengthened. The main reasons I think for these changes in the EU's perception of China are three sectors. First, the EU believes that China's rise will bring great changes to Europe, which is an important consideration to promote the EU to adjust its China policy. Secondly, the socialist diplomatic concept with Chinese characteristics is impacting the inherent traditional values and the diplomatic source of the West. And there are differences in coalition between China and the EU in this regard. And certainly the rising influence of the United States on the European Union and the traditional contradictions between the East and the West caused by the Ukraine crisis has also accelerated the changes in China-EU relations. At present, due to the changing in the EU's understanding of China, the EU's China policy has begun to undergo significant adjustments, including being more conservative in China's economy and the trade energy security climate change and the environmental protection and pay more attention to human rights. In fact, a series of European practices toward China has based on values and even Euro-Leo's perceptions. For a long time, European believes that China's growth opportunities outweigh threats and the bilateral cooperation was also four of momentum. The EU has become China's largest trade partner and China is the EU's second largest trading partner. Both sides should take what they want for mutual benefit and win-win results. However, with the profound changes in the international situation, Europe's perception of China has obviously shaped to Americanization, believing that China's rise poses a seat to the Western system and China's behavior has a obvious intention to overthrow the values-based international order. China's strengthen inevitably means hegemonically struggle. Under guidance of this erroneous concept, some European countries do not hesitate to deviate, deviate from the creeds and the principles previously adhered to by Europeans and focus more and more on dealing with China. In the field of technological, tech, technical cooperation, it uh, violates market principles and like to join hands with the United States 
to obstruct China-EU technical cooperation, adopt protectionism in the field of trade, and set more and more preconditions for trade cooperation, such as investment security review. After EU po positioned China as an institutional competitor in, 19, in 2019, there was problems in China-EU relations and the EU's ability and the willingness to control China-EU differences become increasingly insufficient. So my conclusion is, it is undeveloped that there are objective, objective reason, reasons for the agri aggravation of misunderstanding toward the China by some European countries in the past two years. First, the COVID-19 epidemic has blocked personal exchanges between the two sides and face-to-face -face communication is becoming less and less. Second, the conflict between Russia and Ukraine has intensified the understanding confrontation between the two sides. China hopes to have an independent judgment on any major international issues based on its own interests. Well, Europe does not understand what China thinks. Europe is becoming more and more like the United States, less and less believing in soft power and uh, preferring to fight hard. Thank you for your listening. Thank you very much. Um, and after the last presentation, um, everyone has time to reflect to each other's presentation. But now I would like to uh, pass the floor to Ms. Yinling, Director, Senior Research Fellow at Department, Department of European Studies, China Institute of International Studies. Xin Ning, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. And uh, also thanks for the organizers to invite me to share my thoughts on the China-Europe relations. Uh, I totally agree with the former speaker uh, the point as regards to the transformation of the world and the transformation of China-Europe relations. Uh, I'm not so uh, uh, pessimistic, uh, but uh, uh, really there are challenges here. Uh, as a Chinese uh, observer, uh, uh, I, I, I could see uh, the shift of uh, uh, Europe itself as regards to the world, its own worldview and also its perception towards China. So. Uh, I think uh, that uh, till today, uh, uh, it evolves towards a kind of uh, increasing the tensions uh, with China. So I like to address the issue from the uh, following uh, points. The first one is the changing, you know, worldview of Europe and how uh, that kind of change. Uh, will impact on the on its perception towards China, and uh, finally leading to the uh, you know the difficulties uh, to the bilateral relations. Uh, I totally understand uh, the logic behind Europe's uh, worldview change, but whether we showed you know a jump outside of the box to, you know, uh, to see Europe itself as a factor to shape the world instead of to follow the, you know, uh, kind of uh, um, negative shift of the world. Uh, today, three main changes happening there in Europe as regards to the world or the world order. Uh, all of these related to very key issues. The first one is whether the world 
today are in a situation of a, you know, mutual learning or mutual cooperation. Or in other words, Europe's worldview today has shifted from the past liberalism towards real politics or a kind of in pursuit of a power politics. If you look at the recently, uh, actually uh, launched uh, two months ago, uh, the strategic compass, I think that is the kind of a statement on power politics. So uh, that, that pose a key question. You need answer. That is, to what extent we cooperate? How to balance? a kind of rivalry, a kind of cooperation, and a kind of competition. That's a very delicate balance you have to do. Otherwise, actually, you consider yourself as a, as a object shaped by the world. Instead of a subject to shape the world, of course, that's applied to all the world actors. This is the first observation. The second one as regards to the, uh, I think EU itself, its integration is a kind of, uh, you know, super globalization. The case of super globalization. When we're talking about the four freedom, uh, for free moments. And EU itself developed in the process of globalization. Uh, even today, uh, we, 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 we talk about uh, de-globalization, we talk about the manager the decoupling within Europe. It's still important to see the trade, the investment is indispensable for Europe's uh, growth and economy, uh, uh, economic growth and job creation. I think that's another fact of our lives. So, uh, but today we witness a worrying trend. You talked more and more about the vulnerabilities of interdependence. It seems EU is on the way of, uh, uh, let me see, managed the decouple. So that is the, EU's position toward globalization. I totally understand the globalization should be managed. They should have a kind of mechanism to make globalization fairer, to make more people benefit from the process. But it's really, what really counts is not the position against the globalization. What really counts is an internal mechanism to make the distribution fairer. And the third one, I think, uh, as regards to the issue of, uh, let me say, what's your attitude towards diversity? We, we have learned in the whole history of European integration, that is uh, unity in diversity. That is a core principle of EU integration. Why not to be applied globally? So my point is how to deal with the cultural differences, the institutional differences between China and Europe, whether we really need to fall into the trap of the so-called democracy versus so-called autocracy in your eyes. So I think these three main issues finally determine EU's perception toward China. The first one is regards to strategic positioning of relations between China and Europe. In 2019, the document has been published the so-called strategic rivalry, competitor, and the partner, uh, the trial caps there on China. It's okay. 
as long as you could deal with the delicate balance, but it's worrying for us. This kind of balance has shifted to a large extent towards the rivalry, you know, uh, position. So when you look China through the mirror of all, or through the mirror of a rivalry, then it will, you know, erode the basics of China EU cooperation. I'm afraid that's a part of the reality today. So this is the first point as regards the position towards China. The second one is how to look at the economic interdependence between China and Europe whether we should leave the political, you know, to leave the economic logic in the hands of the po politics logic. Or in another way, whether we, you know, uh, because uh, today uh, the topic of uh, decreased dependence on China uh, has been very hot, very popular. But actually, when we look at the uh, reality, when we talk about the interdependence, the vulnerabilities not only belong to Europe, China, if you look through that dimension, China also could feel that kind of a vulnerability, right? And uh, when talking about the weaponization of economy or trade or investment, whether EU is really practicing that kind of things today by, 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 by using sanctions globally, that's really worrying. So uh, that's the second one. How to look at the interdependence. Is it a kind of strength or it's a kind of vulnerability? Or, you know, you, you need to keep a kind of balance to see. So this is the third one. The, the fourth one, I think, uh, related to the, uh, actually related to the first one. Uh, if you look at the rivalry perspective, through the rivalry perspective, you see the uh, difference uh, as regards to the so-called ideology. Uh, the, 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 you will see that kind of difference as a kind of con confrontation or rivalry. And today we see EU tries to uh, integrate the ideology differences into almost all the areas, in trade, in investment, even in security areas. That will fundamentally challenge the basis of China-EU relations. Because in the past we say, China and the EU don't have uh, geopolitical tensions. But if you see through that kind of dimension, that kind of uh, precondition will not be valued again, not to be, you know, not, not, not be uh, uh, effective again. So that is the, uh, my second part, the changing perception, perception toward China. Uh, and uh, uh, the third uh, part actually uh, is uh, the reality. When we see the dominant topics uh, as regards to China and Europe, it seems uh, competition, rivalry, uh, ideological conflict, et cetera, et cetera. But when you look at the reality, in the past year, we see the increasing trend, trade and investment between China and Europe. So we could clearly see what kind of logic should dominate. Uh, and also, if you consider current context, the whole global economy is a very you know, gloomy. And uh, both China actually and Europe are facing the challenges. That's the kind of systemic challenges. At current 
within this context, it's really indispensable actually for China and Europe to continue the kind of cooperation. As long as we see the growth as a priority, we see the welfare of the human as a center. So that is the, 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 the first, first point. We should look at the reality. And the second, interdependence. Whatever, you know, politicalization of the issues of interdependence, we have to face the reality. Looking at the epidemics, looking at the climate change, all of these global challenges it, 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 uh, uh, need the that couldn't be decoupled, right? As our European partners always say, nobody will be safe until everybody is safe. I think China totally agree with that kind of spirit. So even you code political science on issues, but the reality is there, we have to face, we have to join hands to deal with these kind of challenges. And the third one, I think is also the most subtle one, is how to deal with the differences ideologically. Actually, we, we have a lot of commonalities. It's natural, China and Europe, uh, you know, have different understandings as regards to the uh, human rights, uh, as regards to democracy, because we all know that kind of concept are to some extent rooted in each other's own history. And the political systems, so do the political systems. And uh, in the past, European Union or European countries have done a lot to promote democracy overseas through the aid, through the trade. Whether you are, whether you succeeded in that. So why not to, you know, follow the logic of a unity in diversity? Today, China talking about the community culture. The, the whole world is a global community. And actually, European community, European Union is the specific fruit of the concept of community. Whether we could find some commonalities between this kind of two different concepts or the similar concept. I think today, China and the Europe should actually shape the use of our own strengths to jointly shape the global order in the transformation instead of being shaped, shaped by the transformation. So I think I, I, I like to stop here and thank you all for your attention. And I hope we could continue the exchange uh, on the uh, uh, on the points. Thank you again. So thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, you raised a lot of important things and question uh, during your presentation. And as I have also mentioned, that the problem is that the EU is uh, more divided than ever before. So I don't know what could be the solution for that, um, but a joint seminar is a good start um, uh, to, to find some uh, solution for that. And uh, now I would like to ask my former colleague, uh, Tomasz Boroni, who is now the Deputy Director of Strategy at the Institute for Foreign Affairs and Trade of Hungary, and uh, his presentation title is Changes and Continuities in Transatlantic Relations and in the Eastern Opening Policy. So, Tomasz, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much, Veronica, indeed. Uh, former colleagues, and uh, I think this is the point where I uh, need to take the opportunity to say thank you for the organizers, the Alta Yosef Knowledge Center and the Chinese uh, Academy of Social Sciences for putting together uh, this conference and I can tell you I think this is a very uh, enriching conversation about uh, the very issues at hand and uh, I was by listening to the to the presentations and discussions so far I I uh, really had the impression that uh, we share you know lots and lots of points in common uh, and that this is a very um, the many very honest forum of, of conversation so i don't want to disappoint you i uh, really try to to do the same uh in my in my presentation um so so far uh we have been uh provided with uh a general global outlook whether it's a is a cold war or or, or cold, cold war 2.0 or any other uh, set of uh, international framework, uh, but also uh, specifically Chinese and uh, other viewpoints on uh, how uh, those you know, multiple crises affect the international life. In my presentation, I would rather focus on Europe as an entity. Uh, and uh, in this, uh, in my take of, of the events, I think uh, the Europe as an entity uh, actually pretty much behaves uh, in one way, uh, as it always had, uh, like striving for unity, uh, but also uh, with an increasing uh, with an increasing power of division. Uh, that's one of the one of the key uh, developments. Uh, but but again, I think. It shows a lot of continuity. Uh, what I sense as a major rupture is uh, the more aligned policies within the transatlantic community. That is, like more uh, pressure uh, by the United States to for the European Union to follow suit on those policy issues. Okay, so to begin with. When the von der Leyen Commission came into office, uh, they vowed to become so-called geopolitical commission. I, I don't know if you if you still remember this thing, uh, but uh, by the time uh, the commission was set up, it was a talking point that this is going to be a geopolitical commission. What they meant by this, according to those pronouncements, was uh, that they are vowing to represent European interests, European geopolitical interests on a global level. Uh, obviously, they didn't quite count on either the pandemic or the deteriorating international environment, but still what we see today is more like uh, championing a geopolitical agenda without European geopolitical interests, um, <clears throat> which is in my wording or in my take is like pretty much the opposite uh, than you know becoming a geopolitical uh, commission um, <clears throat> now um, i think in uh, this renewed geopolitical agenda uh, i think the eu remained uh, pretty much reactive uh, to the events or the deeds um, for instance by russia but also it became a follower, uh, like those of the policies of the United States to a to, to great extent. Um, keeping in mind that uh, you know, institutional frameworks such as the EU uh, have this tendency and they put effort in remaining the same and maintaining the same structures, uh, I think we also have to see uh, what has changed. So first, uh, I think the first uh, domain that needs to be scrutinized is security, because the, because the security situation uh, undoubtedly altered to a great extent and uh, to the detriment uh, of, uh, of all of us, of Europe. <clears throat> so what happened is, uh, the Russian war in Ukraine, uh, which is pretty much uh, came as a surprise uh, to European defense communities. Uh, obviously, uh, the Europeans were already convinced 
uh, and know about the political tensions between Russia and Europe, and they were well aware of, let's say, the hybrid uh, means of, uh, you know, such a such a ten such tensions, such conflicts. Uh, but uh, there was a general consensus uh, in the transatlantic community that it's not going to uh, be heated up to the point of a uh, of an armed conflict. Uh, Except for the British and the Americans, they they they, they had uh, been convinced that there will be, uh, but most most European countries did not, and uh, this was what was communicated then back then in, in February, but also uh, there have been uh, you know public uh, uh, admissions of this fact as well. So uh, how does this change the security situation? Pretty obvious. We don't know uh, the war objectives of, uh, of, uh, of Russia. Uh, they don't really state it. And they keep lingering the fact whether they might escalate the conflict in some point or another, both in terms of geography or in terms of uh, intensity. And uh, my conviction is that the key to those escalations are also pretty much in Moscow. That is, I think, the Ukrainian side or those supporting Ukraine uh, are in a much uh, worse position to, to, to control the escalation of the war than Russia does. Uh, and we don't quite know about it. And I think that creates a very uh, unstable uh, security situation. Now, um, the other very important point is that due to the political and military tensions in the continent, uh, the, the net result of the changing security situation is the disappearance of the neutral pale between Russia and NATO. That is, uh, obviously, you all heard about the Finnish and Swedish uh, desire to join NATO and NATO's positive response and Russia's uh, you know, general acquiescence uh, to this very fact. But uh, I think um, it is not often uh, admitted in the transatlantic community, but obviously, if you really consider uh, the other power your adversary, then you have to also admit that uh, a neutral pale actually enhances your security and that decreases it. So uh, the effective disappearance of this neutral pale is obviously uh, to the detriment of the European security situation. <clears throat> um, all of this points to the fact that uh, the European uh, the European uh, attitude towards defense needs to be changed uh, to, a, to a great extent, because uh, for quite some decades, uh, the general consensus was that the, uh, that the role of uh, old style military conflict is over. Uh, so we don't need to have large armies. We don't really need to have like, robust defense industries. And even though, uh, you know, those axioms started to change a little bit uh, by the time or after uh, the Crimea crisis of 2014, uh, it, uh, it really didn't initiate a sea change of things. Now there are, there are vows to, on the side, for instance, of Germany or, or on the side of Poland to develop large mass armies. If I would have said mass army like five years ago, like uh, everyone would have laughed at me uh, because it was so obvious, so called that the that the that the era of mass armies are over, especially in Europe. Uh, now the situation is different, and again, those two large countries have already uh, announced that they are to develop mass armies with heavy weaponry also. Uh, but the point is, and I think uh, it, has all, it has already been mentioned during this conference, uh, that um, it would be really, really hard to, to have this military buildup without strong industrial basis and strong financial basis. And now I think uh, it just, doesn't show today uh, how it will uh, work out. So obviously the security situation deteriorated. Whenever security situations deteriorate in Europe, that always means a closer alignment 
to the United States in the framework of NATO, uh, which is you know, uh, very obvious and very logical, uh, but also outside the framework of NATO, which I which I tend to find like more problematic in, in, in many ways because security is like one thing and uh, your economic security is, uh, is, is a different thing. And while in terms of security, the United States and Europe tends to agree, uh, I think, the economic interests, the economic security interests of uh, those two geographical regions are increasingly more di divergent, uh, and that will uh, create issues uh, in the following uh, months, maybe years. Okay, so the second point is uh, the economy. I don't know how it looks like from from outside, but uh, we in Europe tend to believe and <clears throat> tend to tend to believe it to be obvious that uh, the legitimacy of European governments has always been rested on the idea of unprecedented European living standards, especially uh, after the conclusion of the Second World War. Uh, mm -hmm. That was again, you know, part of the uh, uh, part of the great part of the bigger political picture that. Uh, Okay, after the Second World War, European countries do not strive to maintain their colonies to begin with, do not strive to maintain even a middle power position, uh, but they are you know, very satisfied countries with satisfied populations because uh, the level of living standards are high, the levels of, uh, of consumption uh, are, all, are also very high. And this is how uh, first European governments usually and enjoyed you know pretty much uh, a great legitimacy uh, but also it, it it also created a very interesting political ph phenomenon that you know most leading political parties converged to like one mainstream political philosophy uh with no uh with, with, with no major alterations so that both the historical left and, and the historical right parties tended to be very, very similar. That, that's one of, the, one of the issues of European politics uh, to begin with. If you consider uh, in the United States, the opposite happened. So why the Republican Party and the Democratic Party were like very similar in the 1970s, but not today, uh, the Christian Democrats in Europe and uh, the Social Democrats in Europe uh, have become increasingly interchangeable and very, very similar in the past decades. I think that's a very interesting, uh, you know, parallel or, or divergent development uh, in the transatlantic community. <clears throat> now, this... Uh, you know, the economic growth, this thriving of the continent, uh, this living standard uh, is actually threatened on two levels. One level is uh, the, the popular level, that you know, people uh, who used to live in comfort and, uh, and the relative affluence and now may face because of the energy crisis, you know, increasing difficulties in some of the some of the very basic needs uh, that they have to fulfill as you know human beings. Um, even though I don't quite expect at this point this to be you know very fatal, this to be you know like very much tragic, uh, but it could turn out to be. And this you know drop in the level of comfort is obviously in itself a uh, you know, major blow to legitimacy uh, and also like every other thing. But there is another level uh, in which uh, there is a threat in the economic domain and that's competitiveness. You remember I said that at the beginning there was, a, uh, there was this uh, effort by the European Commission to become a geopolitical commission, as they said, and uh, one of the key agenda points was, sorry, uh, that's an ambulance outside, sorry. Uh, so, so, when, uh, so when, it, when, when this whole concept started out, competitiveness was a key point. Competitiveness that was to be defended from outside competitors, including the United States, to a certain extent. This was what they called autonomy strategic. That's 
strategic autonomy in French. This is a very French concept, and you know, the French industry uh, has its very historic uh, points of conflict with, let's say, the American defense industry, for instance. And that was a major emphasis on uh, the original comp uh, uh, the original um, concept of the von der Leyen Commission. Europe, the European competitiveness vis-a-vis uh, -vis that of the United States uh, was constantly shrinking. If you just consider uh, how you know how how many global companies you have from America and how many from 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 Europe, for instance, uh, in 1990, many of the leading IT companies were Europeans, uh, even from like smaller countries like Italy. You had Olivetti. Where is Olivetti now? All you have now is like most of them are American. Uh, even the French had those comp competition issues. But okay, let's take the whole at once and say, okay, European competitiveness. But this European competitiveness was based on German competitiveness to begin with. And German competitiveness uh, was partly based on like uh, cheap raw materials from Russia. And also uh, like a very fruitful mutual relationship with China, uh, and uh, this is something. If you, if you, if both uh, prong uh, the the conditions of which deteriorate, obviously uh, the net European competitiveness will also deteriorate. Now that basically cheap hydrocarbon from Russia is over, uh, I think uh, it uh, levels up the importance of China in the European Union. Uh, and uh, even though I don't think it is very visible on the rhetorical level, I believe if there is some logic uh, into European politics, I think uh, the, the relationship with China will definitely level up. Uh, and uh, third uh, point in terms of economy, I think based on what happened during the first wave of COVID when, uh, when there were you know, so much talk about European solidarity, but what you saw, uh, especially in the first week of the pandemic, when uh, you know, uh, richer countries basically stopped the flow of, uh, of health equipment to like poorer countries, uh, I don't think uh, that uh, the general reaction of European countries would be very much different uh, if the crisis would continue to grow. So there will be also a competition beyond all the rhetoric of unity and unison, which is also, you know, a political product, uh, the importance of which has been leveled up. So uh, European un EU unity as a political product is like more important than before. Uh, I really expect that uh, the individual nation states will be competing for for economic opportunities like uh, heavier than before. Uh, obviously. Uh, this economic situation uh, will definitely uh, will definitely affect negatively uh, the uh, the general resilience of the European Union and also the general competitiveness and the security situation as well because they are all intertwined. And my third and last point, uh, I hope uh, I'm not you know getting you bored uh, by all this. Um, so my third and uh, last point is like political considerations, because I think there are very important and interesting developments in this field as well. And I would like to begin with uh, you know, some of the ideas that has been put forth uh, by some very influential EU leaders, including the German Chancellor, Mr. Mr. Olaf Scholz, uh, because the issue of EU accession, EU enlargement is now reopened. And uh, I think you remember that in 2019, the French president and, you know, the uh, not only the French president, but there was this wave that actually at the time uh, signaled that the EU has lost, lost interest in EU enlargement. 
for the coming years. Now the situation is different because of Ukraine, but also there is a renewed interest in the Western Balkans in this matter. Uh, but there are heavy conditions. Uh, and again, some influential members said, including Mr. Olaf Scholz, that there may be uh, you know, heavy uh, EU enlargements in the future, but at the same time, you also have to consider the effective uh, abolishment of the veto power. What does this mean? That it basically means that small countries will be no longer able to halt the decision made in Brussels. But if you think about it, large countries will still have it because they have like more weight in the European Union, both in parliament, both in every other decision-making body. That means Germany could still veto, but Hungary, for instance, will not be able to, to veto. Those who might be new members, I, I don't know, in the Western Balkan countries, will not have the power to veto uh, every, uh, any decision that is, that is made in Brussels. If you think about it, it effectively means to track European Union membership. And I think this is like detrimental to like every country uh, apart from Germany, France, and that's it. Uh, which uh, I don't think uh, uh, it will contribute very positively to either the security or the economic situation uh, of Europe. And to begin with, uh, the attractiveness of belonging to the European Union will also drop if this idea proceeds. Fortunately, I don't think it could really proceed because the very foundations of the European Union, the treaties, needs to be uh, modified or even rewritten uh, if, you, if you want to introduce this thing. But you have to uh, keep in mind that there is a very well-drafted idea about that. So it's not just a throwaway remark somebody said somewhere, no, very influential members put forth this idea very seriously. And I think uh, even though it is in the name of EU unity, uh, and I can imagine an argument in which it is good for Europe. In fact, I don't quite believe in it, that it's good for Europe. I think this is very detrimental to both uh, the European Union and actually uh, to like everyone in, on a global level. Because note to self, European competitiveness and European uh, European economic strength is an asset for in, in, in a global framework. It's an asset for China to begin with, uh, and I think uh, like many members are have the vested interest in Europe not to transform into a political project with uh, decreasing economic competitiveness. Uh, I think there is also. Uh, the rule of law, law mechanism, which not the idea is uh, is very uh, detrimental of, but uh, more like the practice, because if you paid attention, uh, it uh, or really developed into more like a political weapon uh, that is directed against some of the Eastern European countries. Uh, and I don't want to talk about Hungary at this point. I'm talking about Poland. Poland, which, uh, which vowed to, to reconsider its previous decisions that, uh, that, that were like, you know, criticized on a, rule, on a rule of law basis. And they did so, but still they were not readmitted into the uh, normal flow of uh, European Union uh, funds uh, in the coming years. I think this is a very recent development. I think this morning, uh, there were some Polish officials who said, okay, uh, we are not negotiating any longer about this. Uh, what does this mean? Obviously not you know, less tensions, but more tensions. So I don't think uh, that actually helps to begin with. And also I think it adds to like uh, the centrifugal uh, powers uh, within the European Union. It is not pointing to unity, it's, it, points to, uh, it points to division. I think uh, because of the economic situation and the, the security situation, the war engendered, uh, I think the role of geography will also increase. So there will be countries who have energy resources on their own, or they have uh, you know, larger coastlines uh, at which they can, they can uh, take in LNG, for instance. Uh, 
that will be an advantage. If you have uh, if you have uh, a great agriculture and food industry, that's also an advantage. But that also adds to your general outlook on the war, on the economic situation, on the future of Europe. So that also adds more to the political uh, and economic divisions of the European Union. Um, what does this all mean? Uh, the point is, and I think I, uh, I, I will not have the time to go into details with uh, the, the Hungarian Eastern op op uh, opening policy, uh, but my, my uh, excellent friend, uh, Mr. Esterhai, uh, will go into this in like more details if, I, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, in, my, in, my, in my view, uh, I think this is, uh, this is the situation that has been uh, turned to verse obviously in like every dimension and it also threatens with like more division and I don't quite believe in the rhetoric that points to unison and to be sure that's bad for Hungary, it's bad for Eastern Europe, for the European Union and it's not very good on a global stage either. So what we need to do is to strive to halt or reverse those uh, processes. And I think, and again, I will point to Mr. Esterhai because he, I think, will talk about this in more details. I think one of the key issues here is once we are blocked away from cheap Russian energy, uh, the other very important competitiveness factor that is, you know, the uh, relationship with China needs to be uh, uphold and strengthened if possible. So uh, this was my, sorry, that was my three major points. I really hope I, uh, I didn't uh, bore you very much with those. Uh, thank you very much for listening. And uh, again, thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much, uh, Tomás. And uh, of course, your presentation was very good as always. But we are running our time, so I pass the floor, Mr. Uh, Dean Chan, Director, Center for European Studi Studies at the Fudan University. And um, the title of his presentation is The Current Situation and Prospect of the China-EU Trade. Uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this uh, very prestigious uh, conference. So uh, the topic of my uh, today's presentation is Sino-EU economic relations, uh, focus more on the status quo problems and uh, prospects. Uh, first of all, about the status quo, I will provide uh, firstly the basic uh, data. Uh, so first, uh, tra uh, trade. Uh, so, uh, we all know that if you have a look of these uh, four graphs, I, I do not want, want to go to the details, but uh, as economics, I will <laughs> no doubt provide uh, graphs and tables. Yeah, so here, uh, Sino-EU trade uh, has uh, steadily over the past, uh, grown steadily uh, over the past decades. So you could see that uh, mainly uh, the trade in goods uh, yeah, uh, grows very smooth and steady. And uh, China is uh, now the largest import source country of EU and the third largest ex uh, export destination of EU. And uh, although the, uh, if we have a look at the proportion of trade in service between China and EU, it's not that big compared to the trade in goods, but it continues to grow uh, still in a very low proportion. And uh, Despite the COVID-19 in 2021, uh, China maintained as the EU's largest trading partner and the EU became China's second largest trading partner uh, because uh, the first one is ASEAN and uh, the previous year the uh, uh, second place is the uh, United States, but this time uh, EU became the second largest trading partner of uh, China again. And, uh, and let's have a look at the structure of uh, uh, trade between China and EU. So in 2021, the EU had trade surplus uh, in the item like food and drink, raw materials, other goods and energy. Yeah, so here you could see yeah, uh, that's uh, the uh, left side, uh, just show these kind of a situation nowadays. 
and uh, you had trade deficits uh, in items like uh, chemicals, other manufactured goods, and uh, machinery and vehicles. Yeah. So uh, I ignore these uh, details of the uh, yeah. I mean uh, these uh, gra graphs, which uh, just show, show you uh, the uh, items or the structures of uh, uh, the trade in goods in uh, uh, according to the items. Yeah. So here you could see also, for example, the the uh, telecommunications uh, uh, yeah, equipment, automatic uh, data processing uh, machines, uh, such as this. Yeah. And then <clears throat> if we have a look uh, of, uh, yeah, I mean, the structure of uh, countries, uh, here the three largest imports from China in EU were the Netherlands, uh, Germany, and France. Yeah, I think uh, uh, no doubt uh, Netherlands, uh, due to its uh, Rotterdam effects, so it's number one, then uh, Germany, France. And here uh, in particular, Czech had the highest share for China in its extra EU inputs. Yeah. And uh, in contrast, the three largest exporters to China in EU were Germany, France, and the Netherlands. Again, yeah. Uh, Germany had the highest share for China in its extra EU uh, exports. Yeah. So here, uh, if you have a look at these two uh, tables, it's just show you. Yeah. Here we can also see that. If we have a look of the uh, share, the uh, Hungary has also a relatively higher share. And then uh, we draw to the uh, investment. Yeah, although we have uh, uh, suffered from COVID-19 pandemic, uh, EU-China bilateral investment declined from uh, 2019 to 2020, but in uh, 2021, the investment increased. From January to uh, September, China's outwards FDI towards EU got an increase of almost 20 uh, of uh, 54%, and the EU's FDI towards China was equivalent to the level before the pandemic. Now, if you have a look at the uh, graph, which show you very obviously. And here, I also want to emphasize that in that in 2020. China's uh, greenfield investment towards EU has reached uh, to the highest level since 2016 uh, with about 1.3 billion euros. Yeah. Uh, so here, uh, yeah, because people uh, sometimes also complain that uh, China's uh, outwards FDI towards uh, EU is not, uh, yeah, you, you know, in the form of uh, greenfields. But this time we have really have seen this uh, phenomenon, which is, uh, I think, I appreciate very much, uh, even by the European side. And then, uh, yeah, uh, if we have a look of uh, the structure of Chinese outwards FDI to, towards uh, EU, uh, here we have the rank like uh, number one is uh, consumer goods, yeah, which account for 36%, and then, and then automobiles, 23%. Uh, percent. That's the uh, first two uh, biggest items uh, when we have a look of the outward FDI from China to, to uh, EU. And then <clears throat> we could see the, uh, like, uh, the item like hairs, uh, from tissues, and also biotechnology, uh, as well as communi uh, communications technology. They, that's actually the four uh, biggest uh, sector which Chinese uh, investment towards uh, EU. Uh, here from this uh, graph, we could uh, obviously see this clearly. And uh, here I also mentioned that the case uh, we all know this year, uh, uh, we have this uh, largest uh, uh, Chinese investment in EU in, uh, in Hungary, uh, that's the Chinese battery manufacturer, <coughs> this uh, CATL. Yeah, uh, this case, uh, we know that, uh, yeah, uh, invest, uh, the, the project, yeah, account for uh, about uh, 7.5 billion euro, which is a very big project, and also in, in the fields of uh, battery, which uh, affiliates to these uh, new energy uh, vehicles. Uh, and also, when we're talking about the trade or are talking about investment, but actually, uh, I have to also to mention always increased, uh, uh, I mean, development of chi uh, China 
where we express. So here we could see uh, from these gra two graphs, yeah, <clears throat> the, the volumes of goods uh, keep growing for uh, three cons consecutive year, uh, reach reaching 3.7 billion tons. So which means a year on year increase of uh, 4.0%. Uh, and the number of uh, China Railway Express running throughout the year reach uh, uh, 15,000 now with, uh, with a year on year increase of 22%. Yeah. So uh, especially here, I want to emphasize the number of uh, land sea combined transportation in the West sent uh, yeah, 57,000 uh, TU, uh, TUs with a year on year increase of 57.5%. Uh, yeah. Uh, that's actually. Uh, cuts, yeah, uh, express, uh, yeah, the close uh, connection between you and China, uh, even during the uh, pandemic, yeah. So uh, besides this, yeah, <clears throat> a very good, uh, I mean, uh, bilateral economic cooperation, uh, but recent years, we all know that uh, uh, from EU side, uh, people, uh, regard China more and more as an uh, economic competitor. So as an economist, I will uh, use some of these uh, economic indi indicators just uh, based on our research and the survey uh, to show you that uh, how is the cooperation and the, uh, the competition, yeah? So here we, we use uh, these uh, ICA. Actually, that's the indicator which, which we express the com competitive advantage of uh, uh, a state in the fields of uh, uh, international trade. Yeah. <clears throat> Second, we use these uh, global value chain position index, which actually express uh, the, the position or the level of its uh, uh, sector uh, industrial structure of a state or a, a, <clears throat> a community like EU. And then we use <clears throat> the uh, index like this ESI, that's uh, Export Similarity Index. That means uh, uh, how uh, the country, if we have a look at the trend, uh, uh, export uh, similar to, to the other countries. So here, <clears throat> uh, first of all, we, we could focus on this ICA, which uh, actually we can compare uh, the competitive advantage in the trade, especially in uh, trade uh, in goods. Yeah, so here we could see that, which I have uh, in red highlight, yeah, the China's uh, competitive uh, advantage of manufacturing industry are mainly <clears throat> concentrated in labor intensive and also resource intensive industries. Uh, so here, if you have a, a look of a right, uh, right uh, uh, left side, uh, these uh, right, uh, uh, yeah, uh, I mean, products, which uh, according to the CITIC code, uh, you could see uh, the uh, competitive advantage which China has uh, in the international trade or in the trade vis-a-vis uh, -vis to uh, EU. And the, the right side uh, is uh, the EU's uh, advantage, which is mainly uh, concentrated in technology intensive, uh, such as chemical, uh, uh, mechanical, and instrument uh, industries. Uh, so here, uh, which I want to say is uh, that both EU and China has its own uh, competitive advantage when people are talking about uh, uh, trade. And still take, uh, taking manufacturing as an example, uh, here you can see that uh, if you have a look of ICA, uh, index gap between Sino-EU and Sino-US from uh, 2011 to 2018, uh, you could see that, uh, yeah, uh, till 2018, uh, the so-called overall uh, competitive advantage gap between China's manufacturing industry and the US and EU is widening, uh, but uh, the, the expansion pace slowed down after 2017, especially uh, since 2018, uh, the, the uh, expansion was uh, slowed down very much. Yeah. Uh, so if we have a look of these uh, so, so called the comparison of ICA, which means 
uh, the measurement of uh, uh, quantitative uh, quantity of uh, the competitive advantage in trade. Then we switch to this uh, global value chain position index, which means uh, the level of uh, uh, the industry uh, industry of uh, states or or uh, entity economic entity, uh, which describe more the quality of the industry or the quality of the uh, potential economic potential. Uh, like here, we use the GVC uh, uh, position index. Here you could see that uh, uh, EU. Uh, which we still uh, include uh, UK, uh, EU 28, and uh, US, which is quite, you know, uh, tic tac uh, and quite close, uh, which is uh, far, you know, uh, upper than uh, China itself. Or, or uh, here from this uh, graph, you could see that means, although uh, if you have a look of a trade, especially trading goods or according to the ICA, China has, you know, the quantitative uh, advantage. But if you have a look of the quality of these uh, uh, industry sectors or the level of uh, high tech or the level of uh, uh, science and technology together with uh, industries, uh, you still have uh, a look at the, the gap uh, which China vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, US and uh, EU. Yeah, it's quite a uh, big uh, gap, although, uh, I mean, the, 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 the gap itself was uh, getting narrowed with time. So here uh, I use the ESI, which means the Export Similarity Index, uh, to show that uh, the competition between China and EU. So only these two items, uh, which I highlight in red, the chemicals and also here the machinery and equipment, yeah? Uh, both sides has very similar uh, uh, export uh, similarity index. Yeah, so so that means not uh, overall all the, the items we have very strict, uh, yeah, strict uh, competitions. Yeah, just in some fields or some you know industries or or, or sectors we have very uh, strong uh, competition. So the key points uh, after these uh, uh, basic uh, data and also the, the uh, phenomena we describe uh, on this uh, bilateral uh, trade and economic cooperation, uh, I think uh, uh, we will have these two key points. Yeah, as two important uh, laws in multipolar world, China and you have no major conflicts on core interests no geopolitical con uh, contradictions, but huge needs for cooperation in economy. And the uh, EU still has advantage over China in manufacturing industry, which is yeah, the key, uh, key uh, uh, points, I think. And the competition between the two is not served as reported. Yeah? Uh, the supply chain issue is to some degree be uh, uh, aggregated because of COVID-19. And also recently, the EU's manufacturing industry has been chased uh, or even surpassed by e, uh, US and China. And uh, China and EU cannot leave each other in economy. And then I will switch to uh, problems. Uh, yeah, actually, we all observed, like the previous uh, uh, presenters has already uh, described. Uh, uh, I think we all observed the phenomenon like warm economy and the cold politics. Yeah. So here, uh, first is the uh, controversial opinions uh, on social ideas and values. Yeah, especially on these, uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah, the definition of uh, EU uh, of uh, Young uh, Commission uh, to China more as uh, uh, economic competitor and also systematic rival. Besides, uh, I mean. Uh, cooperation partner. And also <clears throat> recent years, we could observe the so-called uh, the phenomena of uh, politicalization of economic issues. And also EU, US check and balance in tension. Uh, uh, here we could also see uh, such as the, the establishment or also uh, the development of TTC or these kind of uh, uh, phenomena. And uh, here we could also 
uh, see a list of the EU's uh, defensive measures, which towards uh, Central EU trade since uh, uh, 2016. Although I think it's not only focused on China, but quite some are focused on China. Yeah, the toolkit uh, against uh, 5G and also the dual use item control system, the industry <coughs> leadership, the uh, the due diligence, yeah, and also recent, uh, yeah, just in this year we have these uh, European Chip uh, uh, Chips uh, Act, yeah, which is uh, you know uh, more focusing on the semiconductor uh, ecosystems uh, and also these these things, uh, which was the purpose to reduce the so-called uh, independent uh, the dependence, yeah, and we all know the uh, uh, block or the frozen of CRI between China and EU. Uh, and we all know that uh, these seven year, uh, seven and a half year rate uh, nego negotiation about CRI. Uh, I think CRI itself, yeah, uh, uh, which focuses on these uh, market access, uh, competition rules, uh, sustainable uh, development, and also this dispute settlement mechanism, which is uh, really good for both sides, yeah, but it's blocked uh, regretfully due to the uh, yeah, so-called uh, politicization of economic issues. And about the uh, prospects of Sino-EU economy, uh, I would say the first, uh, the trade friction is usual and uh, dealing with this kind of divergence through dialogue and uh, consultation is more important and the efficient uh, then talking defensive measures, uh, taking uh, defensive measures. And China and EU's uh, cooperation on technology will bring authority into uh, economic growth. And however, EU's strict control on high tech exports to China is hindering the bilateral uh, science technology cooperation. China and EU should strengthen cooperation on global economic governance. Uh, like previous uh, has already mentioned, yeah, I think uh, both sides are advocates on world trade reform, on financial institutions, <clears throat> diversification of the monetary system. Yeah, uh, that means uh, WTO, uh, uh, World Bank, IMF. Yeah, more uh, than this. Yeah, and China and EU have common interest in digital and green economy. And uh, in this uh, fields, I think we have already yeah uh, quite a lot of. Uh, uh, cooperation designs and uh, we could yeah, do it uh, better. So uh, the basic opinion on the Sino-EU economic relations in the future, I think uh, first, I still keep uh, cautious optimi optimism because uh, the economic relations are the uh, still not still the anchor of uh, bilateral relations. And uh, the Sino-EU uh, economic cooperation has a very good uh, uh, fundamental foundation, and we all know uh, uh, till now we have, uh, I think, uh, about 70 yeah, consultation and agreement or dialogue mechanism in the fields of uh, uh, economic uh, area. And uh, I, I do believe that the competition will increase, sometimes it will increase uh, very strongly. Uh, it's not a, a short term. Uh, problem uh, and also EU policy, policy towards China and uh, uh, EU US relations will affect uh, Sino EU economic relations. Yeah, we all know this, and uh, although we know that uh, the uh, uh, von der Leyen committee has uh, raised these, uh, yeah, uh, so called uh, uh, strategic autonomy also open strategic autonomy, but still uh, there is some, yeah, you, you know, I mean, influence uh, uh, factors uh, still yeah, uh, from this direction. Uh, but uh, I do suggest that we, we should see common ground while receiving dif differences. Yeah, so uh, I think uh, I have already time and uh, the conclusion of my presentation is the opportunities and the potential of China EU economic cooperation, the future are still huge. And the driving force for Europe seek a practical cooperation with China is still strong. 
and the EU should view its economic relations with China more rationally. And the EU and China has its own advantages, which are not all the same, but the sides, <coughs> both sides uh, see common ground while resolving uh, differences. Uh, that's uh, really a good thing or a win-win thing for both sides. <coughs> and China and EU could try to promote bilateral relations by uh, strengthening communication through the fourth. Yeah, for example, uh, yeah, although uh, nowadays uh, uh, officially uh, the CAI uh, process is blocked, yeah, uh, but why not if, uh, from uh, the entrepreneur or from the folk, we, we could do something to promote this because that's uh, what beneficial for both sides. So I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. So I would like to ask uh, our last expert, Victor Esterhoi, who is the senior research fellow at the Institute for Foreign Affairs and Trade of Hungary to deliver his presentation. And the title of his presentation is The Strategic Dilemma Caused by Russian-Ukrainian War and Its Impact on Hungary's Relation with China. Mr. Esterhoi, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Chair, and I would like also to thank the opportunity of having here and to thank the organizers to have this great discussion and have the opportunity to share my views with you. Today we had three speakers from Hungary, uh, Ambassador Kushai, I was talking about the global, mostly about the global sphere, uh, while our Deputy Director was mentioned and mostly focusing on the European level. So following their line, I have to talk about the Hungarian strategic opportunities and uh, the dilemma uh, what we have to face uh, to get, uh, the, today due to uh, the Russian-Ukrainian war. Uh, before I'm jumping into the details of my analysis, uh, I would like to draw your attention to the investment, which was also mentioned by Professor Ding. So, because this helps to understand the importance of the problem I'm going to talk today. The Hungarian government announced the gigantic 7.3 billion investment is to be launched in the Hungarian city, Debrecen, with the Chinese CATL uh, is to build a battery factory. Uh, just to understand the significance of this investment, you can say that uh, uh, this investment alone amounts of around 5% of the Hungarian GDP. And this is several times greater than any of the previous Hungarian investments you know, in, the, in our uh, history since the end of the Cold War. So, and moreover, uh, the, this investment was also not come alone, but combined with other uh, Chinese investments. Uh, if you look at uh, the Hungarian uh, government communication and also the media coverage of this investment, uh, if I want to be frank, it has to be said that this was quite moderate. Uh, of course, there were some voices of some praise, but there has been not a big fanfare. This can be very surprising uh, for several reasons. First, the size, as I mentioned, that, that's around 5% of the Hungarian GDP. So, so it's, it's a huge investment. Second, uh, the main aim of the Hungarian government Eastern opening policy, which has been already mentioned in this uh, workshop today, was to attract foreign investments. And especially we had a special target on China. So this was a good opportunity to talk about this investment. Second, the investment also targeted electric mobility, which is a priority of the government's industrial policy. So this should this also fit very well into this into this picture. And finally, uh, it also has to be said that uh, the government's eastern uh, opening strategy had a uh, very strong domestic and external criticism the last few years, arguing that this did not deliver any any big results for the Hungarian economy. So this should be a very good opportunity to. To put this event, to, to create this investment as a political message. So, it, based on these surprising facts, uh, uh, we have to ask ourselves what is happening here. So, the, big, the biggest friend of, of China in the region uh, is, is turning away from China, or what, what is really happening? So, using uh, Professor Chen's words, uh, Hungary rethinking its China policy as some of the other European countries or not. Uh, and to be frank, this has been a key dilemma, strategic dilemma of uh, the Institute of Foreign Affairs and Trade, so our institute in the recent months, 
since the outbreak of uh, the Russian-Ukrainian war. Uh, first, in order to understand the problem, uh, we have to define what is a geopolitical uh, strategy. So any of the geopolitical strategy must answer three of the following questions. That first, who we are, what are our goals, and what do we want to achieve? Uh, what, how do we want to achieve these goals? So how, what should be the implementation? So based on the government's definition, Hungary is a country deeply incorporated in the Western structures. So it is an EU country, it's a NATO country. But at the same time, Hungary uh, is a small and open economy, deeply uh, embedded in globalization. So this is also part of our uh, identity that however Hungary is part of the West, uh, it, from a political point of view, it is quite arguable that it's still a periphery of the West. And from an economic point of view, uh, we can identify the country as a semi-periphery. So therefore, in order to understand, so you know, in order to see how does the government see the major external framework, uh, the growing multipolarization of the global uh, structure, we they identified this as an opportunity to somehow change this peripheral political position, also especially to change the semi-peripheral economic position uh, of the country. So in this regard. Uh, the rise of the new players in the, in the global arena does not seen as a threat, but more as an opportunity. So based on this identification, uh, the goals can be also uh, easily uh, grabbed. So first is to increase the prosperity of the country, especially with catching up with the EU core countries. So in a globalized world, this means that the country must have access to the cheap raw materials of Russia, cheap energy resources, the cheap Chinese uh, imports, reaching the global markets, including also China, uh, access to technology and so on and so on. So use them in order to strengthen the economic position uh, of Hungary. And in this regard, China as a major rising actor was the target of, of course, uh, the strategy. And what is the implementation? That was the so-called uh, opening to the East or Eastern opening. First, building good political relations, with all the actors in order to facilitate the economic ties. And if I want to be very correct, this the Hungarian government did, is, did, did this louder than other European countries, but we have to understand that Hungary is a small country, so visibility is very important. And second, knowing, with the, knowing the limitation of the size of the domestic uh, economy and knowing the dual structure of the Hungarian economy, uh, it was quite clear uh, after a few years that Hungary can benefit uh, in the rise of the West and the growing relations with the uh, Asian countries if it's able to somehow interconnect with, uh, the value chains uh, in order to attract them to invest in Hungary. For Hungary, this traditionally means uh, the incorporation of the German value chains uh, with the Chinese and other Asian uh, value chains. And if we investigate the CATL investment in this regard, uh, we can see that this wish to see the incorporation of the value chains was not completely irreal. So, so this somehow sl slowly started to, to happen in Hungary. Of course, the Hungarian government uh, has noticed that the environment of its geopolitical strategy has changed compared to when it was announced in 2011. So the US administrations became increasingly competitive and harsh with China, but actually the this did not really change the Hungarian politics toward China for several reasons, if I understand well. First, the West was not united in how to deal with China. And especially there was a big dividing line between the United States and uh, the European countries. So the European countries were more focusing on an economic interest by uh, the US on the geopolitical competition with China. Second, the, e the EU in itself was also not divided. So previously I had 28 member states, but not 27. So there were different uh, blocks within the EU, how to deal with China as well. And not just the countries were relevant, but also, for example, some other actors, subnational actors, like from our point of view, the German value chains, which were deeply involved in the business with China. And the third, and also very important element, that uh, those countries which started to have a stronger stance against China did not really gain anything. So that was also an important lesson for Hungary in the last few years that those countries who decided to do act against China did not have any gain. 
Uh, and we could see that this is the reason of the interconnectivity between China and the EU economy. So anyone who acts against this must have to pay the price. Uh, and there was also some domestic reasons as well. First, the government had a very strong parliamentary majority, and it was easy to resist any external pressure in this regard. And the other uh, was that China did not become a domestic political issue, uh, partially because the opposition parties were weak, uh, and also some of the opposition parties also had strong ties with China. So this did not really become uh, a major topic in Hungary, despite there was a big discussion about the food and campus and so on, but, but China did not become as an important political issue as some in other centuries of European countries. However, when the, broke, the war between Russia and, and Ukraine uh, broke out, uh, made this circumstances uh, in a new light. So the first time when we had to discuss uh, the possible rethinking of the direction of the Eastern opening was the first day of the war, if I want to be frank. And, and our suggestion was simply not doing anything because we expected that the war uh, will end quickly and we can get back to the business as usual. So we, we tried, we suggested to the government not, not to overreact. And if I want to be frank, Hungary's position was very close to the Chinese position. And we had a common wish to end this war as soon as possible. If I understand at least the, well, the message of the Chinese delegation visited the region in, 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 in spring and early, uh, early summer. So, but we made mistakes in four of our estimations. So one of the mistakes was that we overestimated the Russian military cap capabilities and underestimated Ukraine. We also underestimated the West unified response and the speed of the responses. Uh, we also made a mistake about the European countries' willingness to, to confront their own economy's interest. So, and we, we, to be frank, we thought that the interest groups within, so within the countries will put a strong pressure on the governments not to let this economic uh, damage happen. Uh, and last but not least, we thought that uh, the conflict remains local and nobody wants to extend it. And after the Pelosi's visit in Taiwan, it's clear that, uh, like the United States and some of the European countries, it also have an interest to widen this conflict into a global level. So, so what we can see currently is that the war has still not ended. Uh, and the Hungarian government, as far as I can see, uh, considers the European countries quite irrational. Uh, and uh, I have to agree with uh, Ambassador Kushai that uh, despite the war has no end, we don't see the, what will be the end, there are some lessons which can be learned after the, after the half year of the outbreak of the war. So first is that the Western identity is extremely strong. So the elites are willing to defend its, defend these, these values for all costs. So we can identify that that's the cultural hegemony of the United States also in Europe, but, but that's a fact. And in this regard, the artificial blocks, which are the, between the free democracies and authoritarian regimes, slowly becoming a reality. So whether we like it or not, that is what we are talking about this uh, in Europe, and, and that is, Despite we see in many, many Hungary see this is nonsense, but it is becoming a reality. And this makes the perception of the securitization of all the ties with all the authoritarian regimes. And at the top of this is China, because we have the strongest economic relations with China. Uh, second lesson, which is also very important, that West is ready to pay the cost of these politics. So and, 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 and to be to understand, uh, we need to pay, pay, to pay the price, uh, giving up the profit, which we were told that that's the ultimate goal of all, all the companies in the, all the companies, all the countries in the globalized uh, economy, uh, sorry, in the capitalist economy, and in some of them also giving up their competitiveness. So, and, and to be frank, the major result of this is the slowly, uh, collapse or dismantling of the framework of globalization. This was also mentioned by Ambassador Kushai, made it very nicely, so I don't have to go into the details, but 
regionalization of globalization is happening. And previously, I, I have long agreed with Professor Chen and, and also Professor Ling's argument was very similar that interconnectivity is so deep that it's unimaginable. So the, the, the cutting the cost, so the cost of cutting the ties is, is too high. But, but in Hungary, we clearly know, for example, that what is the role of the Russian resources in the German economy, so like Russian gas, and what is happening currently, Germany is giving up the Russian, Russian gas. And this is not just going to be a one-time one price shock. It's going to be, uh, because switching to LNG will, will, will deeply bite into the competitiveness of Germany in the long run. And we, they, they are ready to pay their price. So it's, it's, it's quite surprising, to be frank, uh, for many of those uh, who are watching these, these major, framework, uh, major uh, trends uh, in Europe. So based on these lessons, I agree that Europe is repositioning itself. So if you take these two main lessons, we can understand that the, what, so we can understand what is the real problem with the Eastern opening. So the issue is that not the Hungary government wants to, to change the Eastern opening, but the, the issue is that these major trends are happening in Europe and somehow they have to reflect. And the problem is not the implementation anymore. So not how to implement the Eastern opening. So that's not the issue anymore. Even though the objectives are important anymore. So, but the problem is the basis that how do we identify ourselves? So we identify Hungary as a Western country who wants to take advantage of the global changes. But based on these two major trends, uh, this, this identification is also undermined. Uh, so what we have, so what the government, if I understand what the situation we have to do is currently is to redefine its identity and based on this rethinking identification, uh, can we expect something as a, as a kind of a new strategy? So the challenge uh, is here that uh, it seems to be that we cannot simply go back to the pre-war normality. And, and that's the problem with the CATL investment uh, because that really belongs to the pre-war normality. And so if I understand well, the strategic dilemma for the Hungarian government is to act or not to act in, in line of the changes of these trends or with these trends. So the best, of course, would be not to act, but uh, I cannot be sure that, that this is possible. So thank you very much for your attention and looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Twitter, your impressive presentation. And I'm afraid of the fact that we ran out of our time, Mr. Chem Professor. So I don't know if we have time for a short question, or would you like to reflect on each other's presentation? Or <laughs> Professor Chen, are you closing this session? Uh, thank you, Veronica. <clears throat> I think that we are uh, far behind the schedule. Yeah. And, but uh, it is very interesting for this session that all the panelists uh, raised very interesting arguments. And uh, I would like to suggest uh, maybe five minutes if uh, the panelists uh, would like to in interact with each other, if you agree. Okay. So would we like to reflect on each other's presentation? No, I, I will not. I, I would like to leave the time for the panelists. Yeah. Okay. Uh, for my part, I, I don't think I, uh, I, I, I make comments. Uh, I rather, you know, process all the information because all the lectures were, you know, uh, very enriching. I know that I have raised uh, some, you know, at least debatable points. So uh, if there is a question, I'm ready, but I would uh, not comment at this point. I would rather encourage us to, to keep continuing the discussion uh, in one way or, or the other. Uh, if I may, although I am not a panelist, just uh, I want to make two observations. Um, first observation is uh, our Chinese colleagues is that our Chinese colleagues brought in very uh, 
well-argued economic and other argumentation and reasons. But I want to comment on that, that as our colleagues from Hungary told us or explained, those arguments are less and less important in Europe. Those arguments from the era of globalization, from the era of basic economic interests, defining the policies, and this time it is, is not that time. It's very important to understand. I think uh, it, the COVID-19 pandemic and the travel re uh, restrictions also play some part in it. I would invite the Chinese colleague to visit more in Europe and see what the people, how the people think, how the politicians and even the researchers and the experts think. They don't think about uh, trade competitiveness and such things. They think in the terminology of confrontation, political, ideological, and economic confrontation. So your arguments, what you uh, expressed, your narrative shows to the Europe, most of the European politicians that their line is good. China is complaining about economy, so China is weak in economy, so we shall pressure even more. That's what we see in the, in the European Parliament with regard to CAI. That's what we see in other actions. Nobody cares about the economic processes. Nobody. And any argument based on economic processes and economic narrative will fall on death ears. We don't care about it. We have a confrontational line and we go through it till the end. That is the present atmosphere in Europe. So come here and see it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for the suggestion and also <laughs> invitation. Uh, yeah, uh, like you have mentioned, yeah, I, I also feel that the atmo atmosphere was uh, deteriorated uh, with years, although uh, these uh, two or three years we could not go to Europe. Uh, but <clears throat> now, as a globalized world, we, we could observe these kind of phenomena. I think that, uh, yeah, somehow also uh, logically, yeah, uh, if you have a look of this uh, rethinking, I think it's a uh, uh, to reflect from <clears throat> uh, 2007, uh, because before this, we have, uh, I think, 2003 or 2004, uh, there is a, a so called honeymoon uh, period between China and the EU. But after that, especially from 2007, yeah, if you have a look of the uh, uh, you know, uh, China paper issued by uh, EU. That's quite obvious. Uh, even yeah, the 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 uh, positioning of the Sino-EU relationship yeah from so-called uh, uh, comprehensive strategic partnership to uh, these uh, three uh, position uh, more like a uh, uh, part partner, but. Uh, also a competitor as well as a systematic uh, rival. <clears throat> but I think, yeah, uh, that's uh, happened under the uh, whole, yeah, atmosphere, which is uh, globalization and uh, deep globalization. So it's like a pendulum. Uh, so I think <laughs> the fact is there and uh, we just observed and they, we have to do something uh, to promote, uh, yeah, or to <laughs> uh, avoid these kind of, yeah, uh, deteriorating or the, the yeah, passive uh, escalation, uh, things happened. And I think uh, the elites uh, from uh, both sides will realize that's, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's good for, uh, for uh, both sides if we, uh, uh, yeah, uh, do not, uh, to, uh, strengthen these kind of confrontations, yeah, 
uh, more uh, cooperation or coordination uh, with a very healthy, uh, I mean, competition. Uh, that's good, good, good for, for both sides, I think, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we will see, yeah. And also, uh, I really do hope that the cooperation cuts, uh, yeah, con uh, continues to, to keep on. And uh, yeah, because we observe this whole process, yeah. Uh, I still remember uh, when, uh, as I was a student, uh, that, that was 1980s. Yeah, so, so many uh, European uh, professors, uh, uh, scholars come to China, and we even have, uh, yeah, you know, uh, read the book of uh, Hungary uh, Economics, which is very, very famous uh, when we start our reform. Yeah, and then we, we experience, experience this kind of booming period. Yeah, and uh, really, uh, I do hope that we could, yeah, uh, do the things better. Thank you. Uh, I don't know whether the panelists uh, still have some comments to express. If not, and very clear, if you may permit, then I will make a very short uh, conclusion for <laughs> today's uh, okay. conference. Uh, I would like to thank all the uh, panelists uh, for your excellent uh, speeches and uh, deep thinking uh, on the topics we have been discussed. I think uh, the message uh, is clear at the end of this conference, and the personal I have uh, received well. <laughs> and, but uh, also another argument from our Chinese colleague, uh, Professor Ding Chen, if I would like to translate uh, his argument is that uh, it recalls me an example uh, in the early 1990s, when in Central Eastern Europe, you have a transformation or you call it the transition. So at that time, it was also a rapid process, societally, politically, and economically. And uh, several years later, there are also some reflections and some adjustments. So this is mentioned by Professor Ding Chuan, it's a pattern. When you go to one the other way, slowly they will return for some adjustments. Uh, the three years are very difficult for both sides uh, because we disconnected uh, mutually. <laughs> and uh, we do hope we will catch up uh, sooner. And the person that I help uh, in this year still. Thank, so by the end, I would like to thank uh, our partner, uh, Under University of Knowledge Center, uh, for your strong support to organize uh, this event. And I would like to also thank my colleagues in Budapest, our teams. Uh, they also worked hard for uh, bring us together. And I do hope um, either with uh, the Under Research of Knowledge Center or with the Institute of Foreign Affairs and Trade, next time we can have some on site. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. And uh, good wishes to everybody. And also, I would like thanks for the patience of the audience <laughs> to uh, remain yourself at the last moment. Thanks all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. See you. Thank you.